Man, I got a gig, man. Oh, and I can I turn it into a drive. Adam Curry, John C. Devorak. It's Sunday, May 26, 2019. This is your award-winning Gitmo Nation Media Assassination Episode 1141. This is No Agenda. Celebrating one week of wedded bliss and broadcasting live from the frontier of Austin, Texas, capital of the Drone Star State. In the morning, everybody, I'm Adam Curry. And from northern Silicon Valley, where we're awaiting 1999 KW4. Hello! Boys, I'm John C. Devoy. It's Craig Vaughn and Buzzkill in the morning. I know I'm missing some cultural reference. No, you're missing the fact that an asteroid with a moon fling, flinging around. An asteroid that's shaped like a spinning top uh-huh. and a little bitty moon going around it. <laughs> <laughs> is that it's headed? By. Is it headed towards us? Is it going to slam into us? No. Ow. You think our gravitational pull, though, would at least jerk that moon out of orbit? Well, how far away is it? I don't know. I have no idea. Will it hit any space junk? Well, no, it's not that close. <laughs> space junk is pretty close to our, in the scheme of things, pretty close to the surface. Oh, it, it, totally. You know, I was looking up, because of this 2024 first woman on the, first woman, next man on the moon mission. Yeah. Um, and first of all, oh, the, the, well, for, well, first of all, the the a NASA exec quit uh, just a few weeks after he was appointed because apparently, you know, the budget is not not what he thinks it should be. Or here, you know, Mark Sarangelo was tapped. Well, maybe they didn't spend so much money wasting it on global warming studies. Well, so they'd have more money. So here's here's my uh, here's what I'm looking at. The the main thing people say why we haven't been to the moon since the 60s and 70s, essentially 50 years ago for the first time, is a, a cost issue. This is what I keep hearing. Everyone say, well, could we really, we pulled out all the stops. We just, we've poured all the money we had into it and we made it to the moon. So the total cost of the entire Apollo program, which includes all of the rockets, every, uh, all the six missions that landed on the moon, was $25.4 billion as reported to Congress in 1973. Yeah. Adjusted for inflation, that would be $150 billion today. So th- I, I don't believe that number. I believe the number would be closer to 250. You have to, you're using the bogus inflation numbers that the government have been. This is the real. Well, hold issue. on, hold on, hold on. Just before you get into that. So $250 million, that's fine. Billion. Billion divided by six. Is forty one billion dollars for one mission to go to the moon? Yeah. Well, yeah, it seems affordable. It, well, it, right now NASA has a total budget of about twenty billion, with some bullcrap extra. Oh, let's give them another billion to take them to the moon. Are we serious about this or not? How much is it really going to cost? Do we not want to put fifty the f- billion? Yeah, fifty billion. Well, there's no fifty billion being spent, so I don't see how it'll ever happen. Uh, so you think the whole thing's a, just a public relations scam? Oh, I can't wait until I was 2024 can't come fast enough for me to laugh my ass off. Wow. <laughs> Please. That holds a grudge. But I mean, if, if this is really the story, this is it. it. <laughs> like the old fart, you'd be in the, you'd be in the rock and yelling at the sky, the <laughs> yelling at the sky. I knew hey, it. Hey, you guys promised the moon you could deliver <laughs> nothing. Uh-huh. Oh, Okay. I just don't, I can't take it seriously if we're not going to put up the right amount of money. Well, then I don't take it seriously anyway. Well, this is a fact. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. I got to like see somebody write up the story of the Saturn V rocket. That's the thing that got, if we went to the moon, that's how we got there. We don't even have a rocket that's half that size. It doesn't seem like such a big deal. Is it so hard to just build a bigger rocket? I don't know why they haven't built another Saturn V. That was the biggest rocket we've ever built. It's yeah. things, the thing's the size of the Empire State Building. It's a huge thing. Really? Is it that tall? Oh, that's crazy. Oh, it's, no, it's not that tall, but that would be kind of cool, don't you think? Well, okay. More misinformation, Dvorak. You're not helping. <laughs> it's confusing me. Uh, hmm. Ah. I just want to mention one thing, uh, and maybe you've had this moment, um, but we were reviewing some of the pictures and videos, mainly videos from the wedding extravaganza of the century, uh-huh. 
And I have to uh, say with sadness and disappointment that I really believe I'm a better dancer than I am. Holy oh, look, crap. I look good out there. I, I look complete. I'm just going to have to say it. I look retarded. It's horrible. And, and I'm thinking like, yeah, baby, I, I'm nailing this here. Woo, everybody. And I look like a, like a, like one of those things outside of the secondhand car dealership, those inflatable eh, 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 with praying <laughs> mantis arms best. all over the place. It's horrible. Yeah. Horrible. Oh, I really huh. thought I was better than that. Well, apparently you were mistaken. You were misleading yourself. <laughs> so, so I had to do something to to make myself feel good, and I spent the and past. So you erased the videos. <laughs> no, I wish. No, I spent the past two days uh, doing something I promised for many years, and I finally got it together. Zumba, close. Podfathergear.com. dot com. I finally documented it, wrote it all up, exported all my settings podfathergear.com you can and it's all there you can see what i use uh, my own configuration files you can install them get everything up and running with my baseline shows exactly which widgets and and boxes i use uh released under the value for value model of course well let's stop immediately here and the value for value model is going to pay zero <laughs> In this regard, because for one thing, you're not running a bunch of cheap crap. <laughs> no. Well, no, it's not cheap, but it's not crazy expensive either. To, it's close to it for most podcasters. The, the main box is $595, and you can get quite away with with that. I mean, you'd still yeah, don't have... Yeah, then you got to buy the plugins. No, 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 no. Uh, Mark of the Unicorn you were talking about? Mark of the Unicorn has the compressor limiter EQ, all of that built in. You need no extra, no extra stuff. So I'm basically on a, on a, uh, a bare bones box. I'm running barefoot, John. Ooh, it's a, you almost sound like Alex Jones doing that. <laughs> Worked on it. It was my CB trucker. Yeah. So same anyway. Thing. Alex Jones, same thing. Anyway. So I put it all up there, and uh, hopefully, and I also realized that as I'm putting that up there, like I could probably make a good sound on any device <laughs> when I think about it, just with the right amount of time, and uh, and to be fair, with the right partner yeah. who is incredibly consistent and doesn't mind counting to a hundred as often as I ask him to. You can say that, but the other uh, side of it is. Um You're not going to do that, A, for sure. Do what? Just try to try to make good sound on anything because your your real goal is to make the whole thing so portable that you could go travel with. Yeah, that is, exactly. You can't do that with just anything. You can't yeah, have a true. bunch of big boxes. True. But so, but after this exercise, and I'm kind of looking around, like I wonder what other if there's any new boxes out there. And I'm just looking at stuff like I could probably make it work with that. I could make it work with that. <laughs> They're all this. Nothing is cheaper. Or nothing is is geared towards podcasters. But now at least people have a little example of uh, of how I do it. Felt well, good. Know, uh, Hor- Horowitz uses the, the, the dreaded roadcaster, and he blew up, his files blew up. Oh, what happened? Did you hear about this? No, 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 no. I mean, he's he sends me stuff all the time. We discuss the sound, and I'll ask him what he's doing, and you know, that sometimes it's better than others. But he didn't tell me about the files blowing up. Yeah, a couple of uh, the first time he used the roadcaster, he had to use the backup files because the roadcaster didn't blow up the whole file, but it trashed the end of the file. Oh, so they had, had some to... sort of an EOF problem. So you had to pull it from tape, huh? <laughs> you had to pull it from tape. <laughs> pull it no, from the backup. Coincidentally, I had recorded it using the recording uh, capabilities of Skype, and unbeknownst to me, uh, it automatically sends him the file. Huh? I didn't, I didn't yeah. know you can do that with Skype. Do what? Record. Is that stock now with Skype? Or what? Uh, I peer, start recording. I see. Wow, look at that. Start recording. It's right in there. Yeah. Huh. I thought you were arguing me, with me the other day that it was always there. Start recording? Oh, let me see what happens. And then when you're, at least in this case, when it's done, he gets, the file gets shipped to him, I guess, is maybe some sort of a courtesy. So I just record a little bit and then finalizing. So it'll probably send that to you now. Huh, interesting. I had no idea. Well, it's, well, the Skype guys aren't stupid, and it is part of my standard setup. 
I even show how to configure it. Anyway, so that made me feel much better about my uh, my extremely white boy dancing. It's not that I look like an old man. Just uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I thought it was, I thought well, it was you, said you don't have the video available to me. I have no idea. John, don't worry. I wouldn't want to, you know. Did you do the conga well without looking like an old fart? And we we I forgot to mention that uh, Andrew Horowitz and his wife started a conga line <laughs> at the wedding. I have to say that was This the, is from one too many cruises. That was fantastic. <laughs> Things I never <laughs> expected. <laughs> Things I never expected at my wedding. A conga line. And then he's like, hey, we're going to do Soul Train now. <laughs> giving him to kick the DJ off the wooden horror there. <laughs> John, the DJ, the only black guy at the wedding, was like raising his eyebrows like, you doing Soul Train? <laughs> okay. Anyway. Hey. Um, I, Teresa May quit. Let's start with that. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty interesting. I, you have the last uh, tears. Yeah, I got the end of the talk. She she talked for about ten minutes. They made it sound like she was bawling all the way through. No, she just was. she just cracked at the end. Yeah, she, at the end she finally folded and she uh, wandered off. And they have all these pictures of her that are floating around. I had one in the newsletter of her just making a, a kind of a sorrowful face. And of course, the media well, she cried her way through it. You know, and they go on and on. Nah. They, I think the, the British media hated her for some reason. Yeah, how about the British? This and we how about the British what... public hates her? I will shortly leave the job that it has been the honour of my life to hold. The second female prime minister. I'm calling bullshit here, Dvorak. I think you slowed this down to make her sound more emotional. <laughs> <laughs> but certainly not the last. I do so with no ill will, but with enormous and enduring gratitude to have had the opportunity to serve the country I love. Uh, I pulled that as an ISO. To serve the country I love. Actually, mine does sound a bit faster than yours. You hear that? Yeah, maybe it is. Interesting. Not by much. But that, that, um, that just kind of showed... That, mine ended, though, you left. You didn't get the end of it, because I, I definitely boosted the clip-clop, clip-clop as she left. Oh, no, I cut that off of the, uh, of the ISO. I have it in my clip. But it, yeah. it was so... What, what this really showed is for th- two seconds, for a moment there, the reptilian gene slunk away and it was a human being who cared about something. Sadly, it was herself. And that's, I think, what the British public took... Uh, 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 took um, what is the word I'm looking for? Took offense to. They're like, well, now you cry? Now you got a problem? Yeah, maybe. But it wasn't It wasn't uh, like we didn't I'm expect this to she happen. I'm surprised she stayed in yeah. Yeah, past the first re- rebuke of her idea of how to get out of the EU. Now what happens? Uh, is, bojo. Uh, bojo. I don't think so. I think it's going to be, uh, I think it's Gov. This guy, Gov. Gov? Yeah, Gov. He's going to be the guy I think is going to get in. Hmm. He's a Brexit guy. Uh, probably a little more of the hell with it. Let's just get out. Mm-hmm. Which I think uh, Boris Johnson would be like that too, to some extent. Oh, of course he would. That's that, that's that's what he's all about. There's never been any reason to to do these deals. You got WTO as your as your uh, backup, right? Okay, so who's this guy Gov? I mean, now I now I need to know. You, you can't just play a clip of Theresa May and then say oh, I think it's going to be someone else. Well, it's going to be someone else, no matter who it right, is. Right, but, okay, I expected more. Oh, well, um... You don't have it. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have it. Okay. I don't have it in front of me, no, because I wasn't, I shouldn't have said anything. But he's the guy, he's been around, he's been floating around, he's like one of the, he's like Reese Mogg, that guy, mm-hmm. who's also, they're, they're very old-fashioned British, they're talks, you know, very slowly and deliberately, and they, there are a lot of, um... You know, understatement. Right. Uh, and this is one of the two guys, this Gov character. Well, what'll be interesting to see later today is all the, the returns of the European Parliament elections to see how the uh, Brexit party did. That's Farage's EU party. 
Yeah. Um, I, I think that may even matter a little bit more now. <laughs> if who cares who comes in, in in Britain? They have no intention of Brexit, no matter who it is. I don't care if it's Boris Johnson. It's, they, they have no intention of doing that. People's vote, yeah. do over, you did it wrong, do it again. It's the bankers in London. They, they, yeah. they feel that it's better off, everything's better off if things the way they are with this connection to the EU and they can be the little banking community, a little Switzerland in the middle of the, in, in right. the, middle of the UK right. uh, doing their thing and uh, cleaning up on, on service fees. And, it, and the expectation is that a lot of uh, populist slash nationalist leaders and parties will gain a foothold in the European Parliament. Didn't turn out that way, in the, although it was a, an interesting and, and good result for a very young party. There's the, the FVD, the Forum for Democracy Party, which is right wing, but uh, distanced themselves from, from uh, Geert Wilder's party. And he, so he would be right, right, right wing. And they're like kind of right wing. Um, uh, but they came in third, so they do get a couple of seats in European Parliament. But it was the Workers' Party, the Party of the Workers, PVDA, with our boy uh, uh, up front, who would be You're the talking sp- about Holland. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, the Spitzenkandidat. That would be um, my uh, my globalist buddy, Franz Timmermans. So there's a, he has he has a really good shot. Uh, Junker, who's exiting the position did an interview with, I think it was CNN International, and he was asked about you know, this very issue. What do you think about the populists, the nationalists who uh, uh, are rising all over Europe? And his response uh, went noted by many. These populist nationalists, stupid nationalists, <laughs> they are in love with their own country. Yeah, oh. <laughs> and they don't like the others. In some countries of the European Union, the government, the parliament, a major part of the society don't like those coming from far away. I do like those com- from coming from far away because the main guiding principle of the European Union should be solidarity. They are stupid. They love their own country. <laughs> <laughs> what is this makes no sense? It was like a non sequitur. I like those who come from far away because <laughs> it, it's about unity. What? Well, they're far away. Is that unity? Well, if you're a globalist, it is. Then it's like, oh, yeah, unity. Yeah, now we're talking. But those who, who love their own country, they're stupid. Doesn't that just say enough right there? Yeah, it pretty much sums it up. How stupid are you that you love your own country? Eh. Uh, let me see that again. These populist nationalists, stupid nationalists, they are in love with their own country. It's crazy. They are in love with their own country. Why do you do this? This is not good. They want to love the European Union. Good luck with that. Well, <laughs> it's always been a fool's errand. <laughs> yes, to, to a certain degree, for sure. For sure. Um... Let me see. Well, there is stuff going on. I don't know exactly where to start. Well, you're talking about my speeds being off? Yeah. So I had some issues with my browser. I, I fixed it. With your browser? I, before I fixed it, I had stuff that sounds like this. Play Squeaky Jude. This is uh, Judith Woodward on uh, on the um, news hour. Squeaky Judy 2. Oh, one or two? Two? To play two. Let's and now we turn to the analysis of Shields and Brooks. That oh. is syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. Huh. Now, and now you can play Squeaky Brooks. Since- oh, Squeaky Brooks. Hold on. You're confusing me here. Yeah, if when I look at a lot of these candidates, I'm... First- yeah, you know, I heard this with, with, with your previous clip. It sounds like a doubling or something. There's something weird. Yeah, if when I look at a lot of these candidates, I'm first struck by how the self-esteem movement was actually very effective. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like you're recording it twice. Like it's, it's going through... Some, it's, it's almost phasing. When I look at the, the presidency, I've yes, interviewed a lot of presidents yeah. since... Reagan. Or is, the, are you, is this an effect you're doing to, uh, to make everyone no, sound I'll shitty? You, I know what happened. It's just, don't worry about it. It's never going to happen again. Well, okay. This is interesting, though, that this happened to you. Um, because this was one of the most, to me, very interesting ministry of truthiness exercises that we went through with this doctored video. Um, well, before we play the, I, did you get the, I, I think I have a, did I get a, I don't think I have a copy of the I do. doctored I, video. I watched it last night. I have the, I do have this to play. I have, 
the event at which Pelosi was on, she was at some some progressive deal, and she uh, let's see where my Pelosi Trump walk out. I mean, I ha- I, ha- I have the clip that you're talking about, so I I, I have all this. I, Exposing I, Pelosi at progressives event is the clip I'm talking about. Okay, and this is the actual feed from the event at at regular speed, and she sounds terrible. I mean, the, the yeah, they slowed it way down to make her sound drunk, but they used to do that with George. Well, Bush, hold on, hold on, stop, recall. stop, stop. No, stop, stop. You go, you're, you're going way, way ahead of what's happening here. All right. First, there. Okay. I'm just going to keep your clip there. I think it's long, I see. So I just want to make sure that we get to the actual, first, the genesis of what happened. Um, because uh, there was the back and forth between uh, Trump and Pelosi, which started with uh, Pelosi. And let me see. The one that I want here is... Uh, now you've confused me. I was so rid- Oh, here we go. Yes, this is the back and forth. This thing keeps escalating in a brawl of words after the infrastructure meeting imploded yesterday. And the president said, basically, call me when you're done investigating and then we will get some work done. Nancy Pelosi did not like that. So she called him basically unwell. I pray for the president of the United States. I wish that his family or his administration or his staff would have an intervention for the good of the country. Your prayer comments almost suggest you're concerned about his well-being. I am. So the president was not happy about that. Ever the counterpuncher late today, he let her have it over the inaction on the new trade deal with Mexico and Canada that he very much wants to get signed. She's a mess. Look, let's face it. She doesn't understand it. And uh, they sort of feel she's disintegrating before the rush. Crazy Nancy. I tell you what, I've been watching her and I have I have been watching her for a long period of time. She's not the same person. Uh, she's lost it. It was sad when I watched Nancy all moving the movement and the hands and the craziness. And I watch it. That's, by the way, a person that's got some problems. <laughs> Okay, so this was the genesis of the back and forth. And then the president tweeted out this video. We had a little, a long, took a little longer on the floor. In the custody, custody of the border, of the border. Everyone, he started making, sending signals. The U.S., Mexico, Canada, if that's not the accurate character. Some people call it after NAFTA, some call it NAFTA. 2.0, working together to, to uh, make pass that. Not uh, if we, where where the fat. The three things. The three things. The three things. The three things. <laughs> we're very busy people. That was the exact video that I got it from his tweet that Trump tweeted yeah. out. That was not slowed down. And the reason why the three things, three things, three things was repeated because she keeps holding up two fingers when she says three things. So it made her look very stupid. It was edited of her bumbling and stumbling, but it was not slowed down. But this is what interests me, is the the Team Pelosi or whatever bugle call goes out, immediately, uh uh-oh, she looks like she has medical issues. And this distraction was created, and I'm not quite sure how how maybe Rudy Giuliani had to do this to do something. But then, all, then the then the, the for a little while there for maybe an hour or two, Trump tweeted out a, a fake video, doctored video, and, and then when they realized that it wasn't this slowed down video, I have the example here from uh, NBC. It's about the impact that altered videos could have on the next election after a manipulated video of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi went viral, and after the president retweeted another heavily edited video. Of- you see, this it was fantastically done. Oh my God! She looks like she's like she's she's dying. She it's it's not a good video. It's not a good look. It's not a good sound. They bring in some other video that was not even in play at all. Yes, the Speaker of the House, Tom Costello, has that story. One day after that bitter and personal clash, both President Trump and Speaker Pelosi were today dialing it down. But tonight, this video, edited to make Pelosi appear as if she were slurring her words, has gone viral, raising serious concerns. Okay, then they bring in experts on this thing. So now that 
What Trump has tweeted is already behind us, although Trump, orange man bad, he did tweet it out a doctored vid. Now it's doctored. It used to be heavily edited. Now it's doctored. It's been no, doctored they with. They, they combined the two items purposely together and made it look as though Trump sent out the copies of the one and, where she's talking slow. And by the way, I want to stop right now and mention they did this to Bush constantly. Of course they did. Of course. But that and that's. What I'm seeing here is complicit behavior where not once have you seen the video on mainstream that Trump tweeted out. Instead, you get stories like this. We want to show you this video. First, we're going to show you the real uh, video of Nancy Pelosi speaking a couple of days ago. And then we're going to show you the fake one, which has been slowed down, the audio slowed down to make it appear as if Speaker Pelosi has been slurring her words. And then he had a press conference in the Rose Garden with all this um, short sort of visuals that obviously were planned long before. And then he had a press conference in the Rose Garden with all this um, short sort of visuals that obviously were planned long before. So you can hear that edit there. Uh, you know, when you see it side by side, it might seem obvious. But when you encounter this on your Facebook news feed, as, as a standalone, it might not seem as obvious. And look, you know, doctor videos, hoaxes online. Oh, yeah, it's very obvious. They are as old as the Internet itself. What is unprecedented, though, is social media gives people the ability to put a fake video out there and have it quickly viewed by millions of people. This video has been removed from YouTube. They said that it, it broke their policy that it is misleading. Facebook, on the other hand, the video is still up there. <gasps> it, they essentially what? said it doesn't break their rules, that they are having fact checkers take a look at it. But just a few minutes ago, I checked online. One version of the video on Facebook has been viewed almost two and a half million times. Twitter, the president's favorite social media platform, had nothing to say uh, about this video, which is still circulating on their platform this morning. Tony, I think it is really incumbent upon us to educate viewers oh, yes. as to how these yes. things spread, how they're doctored, what yes. to look for. Yeah, yeah, because look for we're going to see a million things like this. Yes. During this upcoming yes, that's our job. We're here to inform you, citizens, that you need to look out for these doctored videos. But. The video that, that it started with is not even played anymore. Now it's just gone into this complete stratosphere. And by the oh. way, YouTube took it off. YouTube took the video down. Facebook didn't. This was a problem for CIA mockingbird Anderson Pooper. He just could not believe what was happening. And I got two clips. I'm so happy. He spent nine minutes with a spokes hole from Facebag, why they weren't, and we're already beyond the video Trump tweeted out. This is now and something. By the way, mm -hmm. by the way, they the the it was a meme characterization that Trump refused to take the video down, implying it was this video exactly. And you know what? I don't know who made who made this slow down video. I, the only place I've seen it is NBC, huh, NBC and CNN. I think they made it. They made it. Listen to Pooper with, um, what's her name here? This is the, this is Vice President, Townsend? no, yeah. Vice President of Product Policy and Counterterrorism, oh, counter counter Monica Bickert. Facebook Counterterrorism. Facebook Counterterrorism with Anderson Pooper. So, Monica, in the wake of the 2016 election, obviously, Facebook has repeatedly told Congress, the American people, that you're serious about fighting disinformation and fake news. Yet this doctored video doctored. that I think your own fact-checkers acknowledge is doctored of Speaker Pelosi remains on your platform. This, this word doctored, it's never. it was always deceptively edited. Now we've come. Who, I wonder where the term doctored, who launched that? Besides NBC or, or CNN, doctored. And what does that mean? Well, this is, by the way, I want to put this in the same category as glitch. Yes. What exactly does doctored mean? Thank you. Doctored definition. Is that a good thing? If I'm doctored, doesn't mean I'm getting healthier. <laughs> Adam's been doctored. Yeah. Treat someone medically. He contemplated giving up doctoring, being doctored. Hmm. 
Okay. Why? Well, you know, first off, I think the suggestion there is that we haven't taken action, and that's not right. We have acted. Anybody who is seeing this video in newsfeed, anyone who is going to share it to some... Yeah, listen to this. So, so Facebook didn't take it down, but listen to what they do when Washington, D.C. puts out a call. Anybody else, anybody who has shared it in the past, they are being alerted that this video is false. And this is part of the way that we deal with misinformation. We work with internationally certified fact-checking organizations. Internationally certified? Oh, Who's doing the certification? Where, where can we get such hey, certification? Hey, who is the certifier? I, that's why I stop. I'd love to know. Who's I, the certifier? Who's the certifier? Oh, wait, stop. Hold on. Hold, stop again. Let me guess. <laughs> Cooper immediately asks, asks her, <laughs> who is the certifier for this 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 fact checking operation who who does the certification were you watching I shared it in the past <laughs> they are being alerted that this video is false and this is part of the way that we deal with misinformation we work with internationally certified fact checking organizations that are independent from facebook and we think these are the right organizations to be making decisions about whether something is true or false and as soon as we get and we did in this case, as soon as we get a rating from them that content is false, then we dramatically reduce the distribution of that content and we let and people know it that up. it's false so they can make an informed choice. Well, why keep we it do. up then? Yeah. If there were misinformation that was, let's say, tied to an ongoing riot or the threat of some physical violence somewhere in the world, we would work with safety organizations on the ground to confirm falsity and the link to violence. And then we actually would remove that misinformation. So but misinformation so about that, here, that doesn't promote violence, but misinformation that, you know, portrays the third most powerful, you know, politician uh, in, in the <laughs> country as... <laughs> A drunk or somehow impaired, that's fine. Drunk. That's fine. So the um, International Fact Check Network has a code of principles and an advisory board. Um, the International Fact Checking Network has seven counselors who represent the geographical diversity of the network. They are pioneers in the development and implementation of fact checking in their countries and regions. All board members are unpaid. Hmm. The advisory board's main role is to help oversee the verification process of the Code of Principles, but it is also consulted on all matters of other decisions that have an international relevance for fact checkers. Let's meet the let's meet these advisors. Let's see who we have here. Angie Holan, she is the editor of Politifact. Clara Jimenez Cruz, she is a Spanish journo. Glenn Kessler. Editor and chief writer of The Fact Checker. He has a journalism career spanning more than three decades. Wow. Uh, Govindraj Ethiraj. Mm. He's from India. Laura Zomer, editor and chief. What is he good for? Uh, let's see. Well, he has over 25 years focused on fact checking and fake news busting in India. <laughs> 25 years? He's, yeah, the, the man is fantastic. 25 years he's been doing this on the internet, apparently. Huh. Laura Zomer, editor-in-chief at Chiquedo, the first initiative of fact-checking and verification of public discourse in Latin America. Okay. And Noko Magato, he has extensive career in the media sector as a journalist and manager, 20 years of experience in Africa. Oh, and then we have one more. Tijan Shevetchnenin. She's from Bosnia-Herzegovina. There's no one from America. Oh, yeah, PolitiFact. Angie is from PolitiFact. Yeah, so those are the people who uh, determine who can be... Nobody from Snopes? No, they're, they are a member of the Fact Check Network. But here's oh, how, are they? But if you, want to, uh, if you want to become a fact checker, we can do it. We can actually... I oh, think we should. We can get a little verification badge. Oh, cool. Look, uh, step one, application... Yes. Which includes a non-refundable fee of $200. No. Okay. Seems steep. And then the assessment. Uh, oh, external assessors will uh, will check this. Who are the external assessors? Lauren Bigot. <laughs> well, there you go. Lauren Bigot is the, is the one who will be looking at our assessment. <laughs> Please. This is crazy. So it's a big intellectual network of yahoos. Yeah, theater. Now, 
Uh, Pooper took it one step further, and this is really, really what gave me great joy to listen to this, because here you have him seeing Facebag as an incredible adversary, and they're not playing fair. I guess I still just don't logically understand... I understand you, it's a it's a big business to get into of trying to figure out what's true or not, but you're making money by being in the news business. If you can't do it well, shouldn't you just get out of the news business? I love that he's saying they're in the news business all of a sudden. Look, I, I reject the notion that we're not doing a lot to counter misinformation. No, I didn't say you're not doing it a lot. So, I'm just saying if you are you are in this particular case. Uh, is spreading and allowing the spread of a clearly false doctored video. Again, you're in the news business. There's a responsibility that comes with that. Uh, and this is this isn't even a question. Uh, we are in the news. He, uh, the doctored video itself. Tell me if I'm wrong here. Is newsworthy. News. It's news. Of course it is. It's, it's newsworthy. News and it's newsworthy. So why wouldn't you? leave it as is and just tell people we think this is a fake. Does, of course, he knows that the doctored video is news. Because he's covering uh, it as so news. So he's full of crap, this guy. Well, well, but I think he's, look, he's, he's part of the system. And I, I, for him to say repeatedly, you're in the news business, I think he was really drawing her out. He wanted her to admit that they're in the news business. Because once, once Facebag admits that, then it's all over. Then all of this uh, deplatforming, um, you know, hiding, shadow banning, you know, lowering significance in the feed, all of this stuff becomes very relevant to Section uh, 203 of the Communications and uh, Decency Act. Then all of a sudden you are editorializing. Well, they're not really in the news business by any no, means. No, I know, but he's trying to get her to uh, admit to it and and saying... By the mere fact you distribute this, you're in the news business. Yeah. Uh, and this is this isn't even a question. We aren't in the news business. We are in the social media business. Well, you people are in the news business. To to share. The reason you're sharing news is because you make money from it. It keeps people watching you. Oh, no, I understand. If you make money from it, then you're in the news business. Okay, thanks, Anderson. And more involved in your site, which I get, and that's fair. But if you're in the news business, which you are... You got to do it right, and this is false information you are spreading. What? what? We have <laughs> coming from CNN. He says that <laughs> I know. It's so, You've got to do it right. How about you guys doing it right? So lovely, ironic. You got to do it right, and this is false information you are spreading. <laughs> we have a site where what people can come and share what they think, what's important to them, the news that they find relevant. And when they do that, we want to make sure that they have access to accurate information. If there is a threat of safety, if we're talking about terror propaganda, that's something where we can actually assess that on its face and say, yes, Get this hurt. is terror propaganda mm-hmm. and we can pull it down. When you're talking so, about political discourse. After nine minutes of this crap, yeah, I'd be irked too. Just and, political and again, propa- if it's misinformation pro- political propaganda. that is related to safety. Uh-huh. Okay. If it's misinformation that's related to safety, we can and we do remove it. And he went on and on and on. Well, while we're on the pro- process of you got to do it right, we might as well play this from CNN. This is, let's see, this is the uh, Scarborough on Trump's mental decline. Oh, day yesterday, President Trump continued. Dude, well, I don't know. This, yeah, you're right. Something went wrong with yeah, your record. Said, don't worry about it. It's fixed. Okay, good. Oh, day yesterday, President Trump continued to erupt last night because the House Speaker said that he threw a, quote, temper tantrum. Tweeting after 9 p.m. last night, the president shared a video edited to show Nancy Pelosi stammering during a news conference with anchors suggesting the speaker is in a mental decline. (laughs) Fake videos of Pelosi altered to make her sound as if she is slurring her words has spread online in recent days. Interesting. Wonder what that's about. Well, we we know what it's actually about. We've been around this block before so the president personally. of course during the campaign we've said it people closest to him told us that they feared that he was in mental decline uh people very close to him 
uh, told us that they feared that he was uh, in pre-dementia, that he had changed. You you watch Donald Trump in the late 1980s. You watch him even in the 90s. You watch him now. He He's completely changed. I've known Nancy Pelosi and been working with her since 1994. I interviewed her this week. Since 1994. For 90 minutes. Uh, it's a, a quarter of a century I've known Nancy Pelosi. I can tell you Nancy Pelosi is tougher today. As sharp as a tack. Than she was 25 years ago. The difference between Nancy and Donald, not even close. He knows he's slipping. So mm-hmm. now... They're actually, we can think about it. It's, it's incredible. They're doctoring videos. Doctoring. The president okay. is sending doctoring. around. All right. All right. You got to be, come, come clean with me, Dvorak. Here's what I think happened. You probably had the same thought I did. Like, oh, it's funny. I'm going to slow down some people, make them sound drunk. No. And no. then you left the filters on all your clips. <laughs> what happened? I, you're doctoring I clips. Into, it's just so I, it's really too long and boring to discuss. But it was it is a filtering problem, and it had to do with some background uh, processing that I didn't know was going to go onto the clips, and I, I disabled all of it finally after I figured out what it was because I couldn't get to this. This there was one. There's some screwball page uh, that is not even linkable on the normal Windows 10 main menu that is puts a bunch of. A, special effects on top of the uh, audio tracks oh and i was playing around with it and i think i left something uh-huh. turned on mm. the problem is this 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 particular <laughs> uh page of of settings is not easy to access and i couldn't find a way to get back to it it was just impossible and because it wasn't available under the uh, normal settings, it wasn't available. I think it's in your menu. Au- it, no, it's, no, it's your audio driver where you can set some of that stuff. It's a, it's. Well, this what were there. you thinking? <laughs> this and is a so, clear so, sign of mental decline. Yeah, well, mental decline. <laughs> so I kept looking and looking. I finally found it uh, by digging through of <laughs> searching the whole computer. Oh gosh! And I finally found it. And I just put. I just turned everything off. Oh but, man. Uh, Anyway, so it, it, the number of the clips have a little little echoing sound. No, it sounds pretty but, crap. <laughs> just... Well, the point is, the point is, is that uh, these two, and I do have a ISO from them, mm-hmm. uh, the Sharp as Attack ISO. Okay, Let's... <laughs> Sharp as Attack. <laughs> sharp as Attack. <laughs> She's Sharp as Attack. Uh, it has such triple meaning for me now. I really love yeah, it. Now. Uh, I, now I do have the actual Pelosi right off of the conference, which is the Progressives event that she was at, and she's yakking away, and she sounds like an idiot. I I think I also have. Do I have any of the Pelosi when she was being interviewed? Well, by, this is the this is the uh, exposing Pelosi at the Progressives event. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, this is where you. Yeah. Start off. Some news happened today. Uh, you, uh, you this morning were supposed to meet with the president on infrastructure, um, but that meeting didn't really happen, as I understand it from Twitter and the news and cable. Could you tell us what happened and uh, what your thoughts are on that meeting or lack thereof? I'm happy to convey uh, my impression of what happened this morning, but not before I thank you, Mayor, for your incredible leadership and cap uh, for ideas. That's a big word. I, I got to be honest with you, John. It's kind of unlistenable. Oh, well, it sounds fine coming over. No, it's this is also slowed down. Oh. Huh. You don't hear that? Well, it seems like it could be off about five uh, percent. Yeah, could be. Okay, I mean, you don't have to play it. Well, well, I, I'm just wondering how many of your clips have this uh, today. So probably a few of them. <laughs> okay. Well, we can't play Nancy Pelosi anymore because then it just it's wrong. Something very wrong about <laughs> about like it. covering the story with slowed down clips, which were not intentionally slowed down. <laughs> okay. Well, she sounds terrible. She does. I mean, I don't care what you play Pelosi in any of her press conferences. Yeah, you can clip it out and make her sound worse, but she just sounds bad anyway. Well, she stammers and she she does she does what Ron Paul used to do when Ron Paul was excited. He'd clip words. 
<laughs> we're going to MP, and then she'd go on with something else. She would never finish a word. She'd say MP instead of impeach. Oh, Ron, Ron Paul would do that? Ron Paul did it constantly. He would always clip words, and so as he spoke, he would not finish a word because he didn't think it was necessary. And I got plenty of examples of it, but she's doing it all the time. I think a lot of people that are, I don't know how you develop this habit. It's, it just seems like a habit that you develop somehow. Of just but cutting off words. It. Well, there's also something to be said for her being in her late 70s. You know, it's like, hey, it's like Nadler. Hey. Like, holy crap, man. How old is Nadler? Nadler's 71. Well, Nadler is in deep trouble as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you know, this, that wasn't just some fainting that guy did. He looked, he looked like he had something a little more serious take place. We had an EMS guy, that uh, EMR, whatever they're called. EMS. EMR. EMT. Yeah. EMT. Yeah. Yeah, he sent me a note. He says, you know, this does happen with dehydration with older people. He says, Did, he's seen it before. It may not be anything that anyone thinks. Well, he, it didn't look good. He looked very confused. But again, you know, you're 71 and you're dehydrated. Yeah. Only if you're Hillary... He's got a big bucket of water in front of him. Why don't you take a sip? <laughs> Except if you're Hillary Clinton, then, you know, then doesn't quite count. If you, you know, if, the, if you fall down because of the heat. But uh, Jerry Nadler, it's okay. What I thought was interesting is what de Blasio, the way he approached the situation. But I certainly want to see us have the ability to add more when we need them. And I think the, the congressman's right about that fact. Jerry, you want some? Yeah, I got some. Some here, Jerry? Take a drink. You look a little dehydrated, brother. I love this. You look dehydrated, brother. But since when was this? It's like, brother. You, you seem a little dehydrated. You okay? Hey, bro. You want to take a drink of this to give yourself some? How you feel, man? Yo, how are you feeling, man? You okay? You okay, brother? You all right? You all right? Yeah. What is this brother business? Brother, brother. man. Jeez. That's what you say to someone you really don't know really don't probably even want to converse with? I mean, th those are two total strangers. If if a guy says, hey, how you doing there, brother, when the guy's clearly not doing okay, it's not like, hey, Jer, how you doing? Hey, Nadster. No, none of that. <laughs> Nadster. <laughs> brother. <laughs> hey, brother. Nah. <laughs> well, he didn't look good, especially in the close-up video that somebody made. Right, but th but but this is this is really the bottom line. I saw nothing but friendly mainstream media doing every, anything possible to distract people away from the fact that the um, leadership of representatives, because they're not our leaders, they lead the representation by some mechanism, that they are older. And, you know, hey, everyone gets old and I'm going to get older and we're all going to get crutchety and messed up and make stupid mistakes. I already look like a, a moron dancing. So, you know, I, I would hate to be in their position. But, hey, isn't it telling us something? And why why don't we see a little news coverage of, hey, you know, at what point uh, does your cognitive skills, maybe you should think about retiring if you're if you're hitting 80 in Congress. Maybe and it's, you're passing out on the, and you're on the <laughs> dais while well seated. Yeah. You know, that's, I think that's a valid uh, conversation to have, isn't it? No, no, apparently that's not possible. And where is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, by the way? Where is she? Well, she's hanging in there. No, she's not. She hasn't been back to work. You're she has. She was back to work one You're day. telling me she's still at work? And she's been back to she's work? Mm. I thought so. That was my understanding. That's what the media has led me to believe. Hmm. I have a feeling she hasn't been back to work at all. Let me see. When is the last time? Mm. I could be in an iron lung for all we know. <laughs> Maybe, but you know, I don't know. I I'd have to I'd have to see some evidence that she's actually back at work. Because she could. I mean, not saying this. You know, saying this just with. Not trying to be mean, but. If she had passed away, that would be easy to keep quiet. If if it was necessary, like, oh, we can't have Orange Man Bad putting another Supreme Court justice on. No, yeah, we, we can't do. have that. So, I mean, look, we faked the moon landing. I'm sure we can fake Ruth Bader Ginsburg going to work, but I haven't even seen that. You know, someone with, uh, you know, just kind of bustling into the Supreme Court. No. 
If someone has any evidence, I'd like to know that she's still okay. Okay, now I got a clip for you. Okay. All this right. Is Pelo- this is Pelosi again, but this time she's on the – this is the interview that Brzezinski is talking about her being sharp as a tack. Doesn't it put more pressure on you that a conservative Republican says the threshold for impeachment has been met? No. No? No. Why? Well, we have to, we're not, this isn't about politics. It's not about passion. It's not about prejudice. It's not about politics. It's about patriotism. And it's about the presentation of the facts so that the American people uh, can see why we're going down a certain path. The American people elected him president, uh, not by the popular vote, but by the, uh, the college, by the electoral college. So I respect the office that he holds, okay. and I think I respect the office that the president holds more than he respects the office that he holds. Mm. And I do believe that we must hold him accountable uh-huh. for an, an, to a high ethical standard, which he has not met, mm-hmm. uh, to integrity, uh, level of integrity that he has not met, and actually a respect for governance, science, and other uh, uh, imperatives that we have. So this is, uh, we have a moment. Uh, But the fact is, is that at the same time, we have to try to find common ground to work with him. (laughs) She knows better. That's, you know, you you sit at home and you watch her say things like, well, I pray for the president. He's clearly not well, needs an intervention. And and you think, does she really mean that? No, she doesn't mean it. If she really, really. You played the definitive clip about a month ago. Which uh, is her clip going off on Bush? On oh, right, 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 Minutes right. Show. Yeah, oh, yeah. Old. Uh, <laughs> let me see. Nancy Pelosi. What was it? it? Was nineteen? It was an old one, wasn't it? Yeah, it was from the um, ninety-two or no, or, or before. No, it was about George H. W. Bush, so it had to be around nineteen eighty-nine or something like that. Um. Yeah, it was sixty minutes. I think. Yeah. Well, well, anyway, yes, that was the definitive clip because she's always been like that. Um, but she knows better. She knows that this isn't that there is no grounds for impeachment. Yeah, otherwise, she'd do it. the The Twenty Fifth Amendment is literally about being um, uh, incapable of performing the inca- really incapacitated. Yeah, can't walk. It will, or talk or whatever it is or can't communicate. Yeah. And she. So on one hand, she said, "Oh." Clearly, something's wrong with him. He's not of sound mind and needs an intervention, but she will not uh, allow impeachment proceedings. Uh, she has mentioned the 25th Amendment herself just recently. Right, but it's just bullshit. It's a bullshit. No, she just, she's just thing. throwing it out there. However, yeah. uh, with Nancy stonewalling that, oh no, there's money to go around. Axe Blue is up in arms and they're taking out advertisements on MSNBC. This is a message for leaders of the Democratic Party. For over two years, this president has broken the law. And nothing happened. You told us to wait for the Mueller investigation. And when he showed obstruction of justice, nothing happened. When this president took money from foreign governments and blocked the release of his tax returns, nothing happened. And when his administration illegally refused to testify, nothing happened. Now you tell us to wait for the next election? Really? 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 This is why we volunteered. Raised money. Went door to door. And voted in the last election. Our founding fathers expected you, Congress, to hold a lawless president accountable. And you're doing nothing. 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 He broke his oath of office. He's defying you. He's laughing at you. And he's getting away with it. This is our democracy. But Congress is part of the system. And the system is broken. We have to fix it. Need to impeach is responsible for the content of this advertising. Need to impeach, everybody. <laughs> Need to impeach. Need to impeach. dot com. This is now they're, they're, they've taken this so far. Now it's been on on to three years. Yeah, you're. Uh, that means that every president now, whoever gets in, uh, we'll Obama get could have gone through this if he wasn't black. Sure. <laughs> yes, he probably would have. Yeah, he probably would have, but this is all stems from Nixon and stems from, you know, then Clinton getting impeached. He actually got impeached and uh, they went through with it. And it didn't. And and as the Republicans say, it didn't really help us. 
No. It ended up hurting us because it really irks the people because they never got anywhere with it. You didn't get them kicked out of office. So what was the point? Just a process of humiliation. Yes. And uh, that's what they're doing. And it irks. It really makes people angry. It turns out that 26 percent of the U.S. public uh, thinks impeachment proceedings should begin. That's a very low number. And that's the hardcore lefties. Mm -hmm. And. It's going to irk everybody else if they go ahead with this. And that's what Pelosi knows this. And that's why she's trying to keep these guys under arrest. But there's a bunch of gung-ho jerk-offs like <laughs> Al Green <laughs> yeah. uh, that are just going to keep doing, you know, pushing <clears throat> for it. And then all these young people, they don't know that AOCs and these other uh, uh, Omar and the rest of them, they, they yeah. think is great. It just sounds good. <laughs> Let's do it. So then take a clip. Well, Come I was going to say two things happened on Thursday on a show day, of course. Uh, that warrant uh, discussion. One is the uh, declassification of any and all documentation uh, relating to any collusion. Uh, the second one is the Assange indictment under the Espionage Act. Which one would you like to tackle first? Well, uh, I would say that the first one is probably more appropriate to where we've been chatting so far. Then we get to Assange. Okay. Uh, so that was exactly it. It was a full declassification order. I think it was an executive order. Uh, everyone has to cooperate with uh, Attorney General Barr. And, of course, it doesn't mean that we're going to see everything. No, 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 You're no. You're not no. going to see anything. You're not going to see anything. <laughs> we're um, not going to see anything. I said we're going to see Brennan whining. Well, I, I, I do. I like how you're seeing people blame each other. And this is always kind of like a a precursor to something coming out that someone did something wrong. And the, one of the, it seems like a lot of people want to point towards Comey, uh, former Attorney General Loretta Lynch, for sure. <laughs> Welcome back to Fox and Friends First. Former Attorney General Loretta Lynch claims that she never told James Comey to call the Hillary Clinton email probe a matter instead of an investigation. We were getting to a place where the Attorney General and I were both going to have to testify and talk publicly about it. And I want to know, was she going to authorize us to confirm we had an investigation? And she said, yes, but don't call it that. Call it a matter. And I said, why would I do that? And she said, just call it a matter. Not so fast. Lynch now says the former FBI director mischaracterized her statements. That is according to a newly released transcript of Lynch's testimony on Capitol Hill last year. Lynch also said that she was, quote, surprised that Comey used the word matter in reference to the Clinton email probe. So more to come on that. Oh, this is delicious. (laughs) I never said Matt. I didn't say that to you, James. But you did. I think that's juicy. Yeah, that is a good one. But but again, if you get back to the basics and go back to your buddy Al G- De Genova, whatever his name is, <laughs> De Genoa, <laughs> De yeah. Genoa, that guy. Yeah, he just blames the whole thing on Brennan. He says he was the real, uh, he was the real uh, conspirator. Right, but we well, we can't leave we can't lose sight of what this is really about. All of this was put into play because the. Um, I more than likely Clinton, but possibly with uh, other members of the Obama uh, administration from 2012 to 2016 were spying on political opponents and probably Democrats, really, to be honest, uh, you know, leading up to the uh, to the election. They were using the NSA database and that spying is what got them in trouble, and you know, and because then they started to use that on Trump. There were you know information coming in from the State Department to have people unmasked. You know, very strange uh, way for that to take place, and they basically got caught. That's what that's the the clip that you played of of Admiral Rogers. Said, oh, I got all this this stuff going on. People are, are just looking up Americans for n- no reason, no warrant. And that's when he put that, he stopped that capability. But by then, they were found out. If Clinton wasn't going to be president, this would come to light. Oh, he did, Trump became president. We got to cover this up. So that's where Brennan, who was probably a big part of that initial spying, was brought in or brought in the Steele dossier and made it all happen. 
it's it's not really not about any of that. It's about spying on political opponents, American which citizens. Which is what you do when you have the mechanism. Uh, yes, it shouldn't but, be a surprise but, to anybody. That's but it, what the FBI has been doing for most of its career since it's been created. The crazy thing is, it was it was Brennan and it was Mueller who were there when this was put into place after 9-11, and they, they swore, oh yeah, we'll make sure this is never used for any, any other reason than as specifically stated in the, in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court uh, Charter. It'll never be used to spy on Americans. The very same guys who did it and covered it up. Of course, that's the way you do it. But but no one is really is really except for Joe De Genoa, my buddy. <laughs> he's the only guy, and he's a kook, which makes it that much harder for people to understand. <laughs> ah, so kook. frustrating. How how will we ever win? <laughs> he's, a he's a kook. Well, then there's Trey Gowdy, who um, he claims that there is exculpatory evidence uh, that was recorded. And exculpatory means clearly uh, shows the person is not guilty of whatever they're being accused of. And when you go and get a warrant to spy on someone or if you're accusing someone or if you're indicting someone and you withhold the evidence that could uh, show that he or she is innocent, please tell me that's some kind of law breaking, John. Tell me there's something with that. It depends on the rules, but yes. Okay. Well, here's Trey Gowdy talking with the money, honey, about it. I, I touched the money, honey, the wrong way, and she went away. Here the we FBI agent's conversations with George Papadopoulos is because when an FBI agent sends in informants to someone they're looking at, typically those conversations are recorded, right? Those people are wired. Yeah, I mean, if the Bureau is going to send an informant in, the informant's going to be wired. And if the Bureau is monitoring telephone calls, there's going to be a transcript of that. Um, and the, some of us have been fortunate enough to know whether or not those transcripts exist. But they haven't been made public. And I think one in particular is going it has the potential to actually persuade people. Very little on this Russia probe, I'm afraid, is going to persuade people who hate Trump or who love Trump. But there is some information in these transcripts that I think has the potential to be a game changer if it's ever made public. You say that's exculpatory. By the way, this was uh, prior to the declassification order. uh, Evidence. And when people see that, they're going to say, wait, why wasn't this? presented to the court earlier? Yeah, you know, Johnny Ratcliffe um, is rightfully exercised over the obligations that the government has to tell the whole truth to a court when you are seeking permission to spy or do surveillance on an American. And part of that includes the responsibility of providing exculpatory information or information that tends to show the person did not do something wrong. If you have exculpatory information and you don't share it with the court, uh, that ain't good. Um, (laughs) I've seen it. Johnny's seen it. It. it ain't good. Okay, I don't know if it's breaking any laws, but apparently that ain't good, John. So I don't know if that gets us anywhere. <laughs> gets us that ain't there. good. Yeah. Oh well. Well, eh. that whole thing is yeah. We'll see. I mean, they the bar does have this. It's got everybody bent out of shape. Mostly Brennan. He's on. I don't think I have any clips. Has he been on any any? Has he been a pundit yeah, he anywhere? Was on, just recently, he was on bitching about this. Oh, I this missed whole, it. He oh. was bitching about. This thing about Barr being able to just uh, unlock stuff, yeah. and he's and and he's going on and on. Brennan goes on and he speaks for the entire intelligence community. I wish I had the clip. Oh. He speaks for the entire intelligence community when he stammeringly says, "Oh, the everybody in the intelligence community is upset about this because it's not the way it should be done." And he goes <laughs> on and on. He says, "Just careless, reckless." reckless of the president to do such something something like this <laughs> and he's really like what is his problem everybody i mean if you look at the genoa and, or listen to ray mcgovern who nobody will talk to anymore right he's been banned from everything mcgovern says they're running like you know scared guilty people well let's remember these famous words of john brennan people are innocent until you know alleged to be involved in some type of criminal activity Mm-hmm. There you go. So I don't know. I don't think he's safe alleged, anymore. Alleged, <laughs> alleged criminal activity. You're guilty. You know, you're not guilty until it's alleged. Well, I, I think he's in some trouble there. Yeah. Well, by his own standards, he is. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, okay. So Assange. Yes. 
Uh, Assange. Now, this is interesting. Actually, I have a clip for this, I think. Um, yes, under the heading Press Freedoms, because that's what this is. That's what this will be talked about, uh, as usual. And there's no mm-hmm. such thing as press freedoms. I just want to remind everybody. There's a freedom of the press, which is uh, per our constitution in the United States. It varies by country. The United Kingdom has no freedom of the press. You get a denotice, a shut up slave, and you just stop it. Um, here is, let me see, I don't know where this is from. This is about the... What uh, does D stand for? Doofus? I okay. don't know. D... I don't know. Someone will be able to tell us. Breaking news in our world lead, the Justice Department announcing more charges against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Let's get right to CNN's Laura Jarrett at the Justice Department. Laura, what are the details of this indictment? Well, Jake, this is a pretty aggressive new move by the Justice Department, essentially tacking on 17 new charges against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. We had seen a single charge of computer intrusion uh, late last month, but now a 17 new charges, much more significant and really a really a big deal here for First Amendment uh, advocates and a concern here because he's being charged with unlawfully obtaining, soliciting, encouraging that former intelligence analyst Chelsea Manning uh, with obtaining just a bevy of national defense materials, and he's being charged with publishing those materials. And so the Justice Department asked today, well, what's the difference between Julian Assange and journalists like you and I? And they said, let's be clear, Julian Assange is no journalist. What another justice official said he's not being charged simply because he's a publisher. And what a publisher? And what they're pointing to is not only the fact that Assange allegedly helped Manning crack into a department of defense uh, password, but also the fact that he published confidential human sources, the names of human sources, which put them in danger, and he knew that publishing would put them in danger. He solicited those materials on Wicked Leaks, and that's what they're pointing to, which makes this case different, Jake. And, and Laura, what does this mean for Assange, and has WikiLeaks responded? They have. They have said this is madness. It's the end of national security journalism and the First Amendment. So obviously a pretty uh, a pretty aggressive response from WikiLeaks there. But, you know, this, this is something that the prior administration really struggled with under the same set of facts under the you know, prior Justice Department. Eric Holder declined to prosecute Julian Assange under the espionage for just this idea, because the idea is, well, what would separate this from The New York Times publishing classified information? And I should also point out, you might wonder why we're seeing this today. Uh, the Justice Department actually had 60 days um, from when he was arrested uh, last month. And so there was a sort of window from when they could tack on these new charges. No telling whether they're going to tack on any additional charges, though, at this point, Jake. I think the 60 days is for extradition, maybe? Is that the I idea? I care about that? any of this. This guy's not even an American. How can they charge him with anything? Well, um, I've, uh, there is a, a Wikipedia uh, page for the Espionage Act of 1917, United States federal law. Um, and the peop- How many people have been found guilty under this Espionage Act, even though we've gone through two world wars and Vietnam War, and we've had all these other act, police actions around the world and, and potential for espionage, and people were blowing up trains in World War II and all the rest? Well, how many people have been charged and found guilty? Um... I don't think, I don't know how many have been actually found None. guilty. Zero, I think. Interestingly enough, Daniel Ellsberg, yeah, uh, who was the whistleblower of the Pentagon Papers, he was, uh, he was hauled before the court. On Man, uh, He actually did the whole act. He grabbed the papers and he released the papers. Right. Uh, Julian Assange was acting as a journalist in this regard because he didn't go steal the papers. And by the way, let's get back to my point. Well, I, I'm, he's I, not an American. Yes, he is an. He's a citizen of Australia. Pre- he's he's living in England. What juris? What is the jurisdiction? President, I'm asking about jurisdiction here. What jurisdiction do we have to charge this guy under any act, espionage or other? Where's our jurisdiction here? If he's so- not an American. He can't. He's not committing espionage. Okay, can I ask you a question? Can you, I mean, I'm, I I understand you've made this point. You keep making it over and over again. Uh, yeah. Gaddafi was not an American. We went over there and shot him up the ass. I mean, what, what is your point? I mean, this is a fucking stupid argument. Yes, he's not no, an American, it's not. and not neither a is. Argument. No, it is. Well, it's to make it over and over again. I don't think. 
I don't think it matters. It's never being addressed. Well, but what is there to say? I don't think it matters. I think the United States, if they want to charge anybody under anything, the Jaywalking Act, they'll do it. I, I, they have no jurisdiction over this guy. Not until he's here. If they get him here, then all of a sudden, you, I think you've got... Even I'm, look, if they get him here, what's the jurisdiction? He's uh, not a citizen oh, of the United States. Okay, I'm sorry. Is the world police going to swoop in and say, hold on a second, you can't prosecute that young man? Well, the problem with the world police is that we're the world police. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> give it up already. <laughs> I'm not. But I think there's something else going on here. I think this is... I don't need... This is for one of two reasons. Either... Somehow, uh, and this has Trump's greasy fingerprints on it. Either, A, we're going to use this guy to show what, uh, what you can't do. Somehow we'll, we'll finagle this into the law to show that if you are publishing things that are just given to you um, from inside the American government or intelligence sources, they want to stop that for obvious reasons. You know, and there's a lot of leaking, in particular when it comes to stuff about Trump, and he and there's a, it's been very damaging to him, and so he may want to use this as a case to stop it, or it's meant to let Julius Assange go free because I don't see any court who could convict I've, him I've on felt, this. I have felt the exact same way. I think this may just they they overcharge him with stuff that's bull crap. The, the espionage law being the most obvious. Where's the Logan Act? Anyway, the espionage <laughs> laws uh, are bull crap, and they're not, and he's going to go free, and that's the idea. I think that's a, poss- a distinct possibility because we know that Trump was happy about Assange, but he has to put up a false front here uh, to make it look as though he's getting tough. Now, just but he just fact to- likes the fact that Julian yes. Assange got him elected as president. Yes, Hello. of course he does. And this may be just a get-out-of-jail-free card. To answer your earlier question, in 2001, retired Army Reserve Colonel George Tofimov uh, was indicted under the act and convicted of conducting espionage. Uh, Kenneth Wayne Ford Jr. indicted for allegedly having a box of documents in his house after he left NSA. He was sentenced to six years in prison. It's not like this hasn't worked. Uh, In 2005, Pentagon-Iran expert Loris Franklin... Were in, and lobbyist Rosen and Weissman were indicted under the act. Uh, let's see. Frankly, was sentenced to 12 years, later reduced to 10 months of home confinement. So it seems like, yeah, maybe not such well, a big well, 12 years to 10 a, months. Damn. 12 years to 10 months of home confinement? Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty good lobby right there, man. Yeah, good job on that. Uh, Alexander... Uh, Jeffrey Sterling, former CIA agent, indicted under the act in January 2011, unauthorized disclosure of national de- defense information to James Risen. You remember that? Yeah, well, how come Hillary hasn't been indicted under this then? This is not for elites. This is not for lizards. This is for humans. <laughs> These laws are not, not for the shapeshifters, John. They, they get to do whatever they want. But yes, I, I think... I think we're both kind of in agreement that this is like, oh, make it look really, really bad, and then I don't even know if they'll go to go to trial with it. They'll come up with some, ah, uh, well, eh, something. It just doesn't feel like they're really going to do this. And, and the way the press is responding, they're not really all freaked out about it, so they must not think it's real either. There's a little bit of this, oh, well, what, well wait, how is uh, it when... different from NBC? Well, NBC is fake. Uh, maybe one way to look at it. <laughs> it's quite different from NBC, in fact. I just thought that was, uh, yeah. So uh, well, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I still question the jurisdiction issues. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your courage no. and to say in the morning to you, the man who put the C in the notice that comes before the D notice, John C. Dvorak. Oh, by the way, the D notice stands for uh, defense. Dis- defense. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Defense. Hello. Well, in the morning to you, uh, Mr. Adam Curry. Also in the morning, all ships, sea boots on the ground, feet in the air, subs in the world, all the dames and knights out there. Well, in- now. In the morning to the troll room. Easy does it. Trolls at uh, noagendastream.com. Good to see you all there. And thank you for showing up. Noagendastream.com 24-7. You can hear all kinds of groovy stuff. Also, in the morning uh, to 
Data, 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 data. Uh, only a few pieces of artwork uploaded to noagendaartgenerator.com, but this one uh, caught our eye. It was the Spitzen Kandidat, and we used that for episode 1140. Uh, the title of that episode was Imperious, and we want to thank Data, Data, whoever that is, a relatively unknown artist, for uh, bringing us that. I even saw um, some Europeans retweeting it, mainly based on the art. They thought it was cute in, uh, in regard to the uh, elections taking place this weekend. Dan, so thank you very much. Noagendaartgenerator.com. We love everyone who participates in our Value for Value network. That includes producers of the executive kind and associate executive producers. We'd like to thank them up front in the show, just like Hollywood. Uh, tell you what they said. Uh, tell you how they contributed. And we start off, I believe, with an anonymous uh, donation. Yes. As a matter of fact, we do have uh, our top donation. It is anonymous. Yeah, oh, you know what? Uh, you know, I have his note. Unfortunately, I left it over on the other desk. <laughs> so hold on one second. Okay. Just to fill up the time. It's always fun to do. Because they always come through the squirrel mail. And then he prints it out on his printer. And leaves it on the other side of the room. But that's okay. He's off to get it. His name is J.C. Dvorak, and you know that he likes to print out things from the best mail program in the universe. Just in time. What timing? Uh, anonymous. It says right across the top. Uh, send a check in, obviously. Dear John and Adam. I've been a listener since uh, the fall of 2015 when I was working 14-hour days installing Windows operating systems in retail stores. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That is a harsh gig. Yeah. At the time, No Agenda was one of many podcasts I would listen to during my commute to work and to college. Now, however, the quality of both sound and content has made No Agenda stand above all others in the universe. <laughs> Thank you. Every That's... time Adam has groaned about low donations or about ending the show, <laughs> I have what I have screamed in my car, wallowing in my flagrant douchebaggery. But lo, residual jobs karma has have karmas karmas have collected collected. That's what it says upon me like dirt on a popsicle. Uh-huh. I. <laughs> Very funny. Somebody. That's a very good I analogy. Like any, uh, I like any other producer would prefer to present this instanite donation in s- something as Raven announces John to the stage. Hopefully, a check will do as well. Uh, he's also an Eagle Scout, a dude named Ben, and a ham soon to be. Makes Thank so much sense. Thank you for all that you do. <laughs> very common. If he was a Marine, it'd be even more. Well, common. so he needs a, de- a dedouching and some karma, doesn't he? Or he has some specific well, I'm, requests. I'm still reading. Okay. Thank you for all that you do to conserve the stress of amygdalas across the globe. Please knight me, Sir Rib Ear. Rib Ear. Rib Ear. Rib ear. Sir, ah, Sir Rib Ear. Please, de- please dedouche. <laughs> You've been dedouched. John. Jobs, karma, and he has jingles. Hold on a second. I, this is not on my list, so it's anonymous. It's not on your list. Becomes Sir. What was Rib, it? R I B dash E R E A R. Ribier. Okay. And does he need anything at the table for the round table? Doesn't say. Okay. But he do, he wants that's wrong. Kim trails. That's true. And a Hillary laugh. Uh, that's he wrong. Wants, that's wrong. Which is that's wrong. I think that's a Peterson clip. Okay. Chemtrails, which is a favorite of yours. That's true. That's true. And the Hillary laugh. Hmm. I can't find it. That's wrong. Oh, yeah. That's wrong. That's true. See, I didn't have this one set up. And then Hillary laugh or a cackle? Just says laugh and chemtrails. Okay. Let's see if we can. And chemtrails. Yeah. Why wouldn't we have all of that stuff? Uh, okay. That's wrong. That's true. <laughs> I'll throw in a karma too. <laughs> You've got. Karma. I don't know what that was. that was. I tried, okay. That was good. I mean, it was it was funnier than it would. I think. I don't know what happened there. All right. 
Now we know you've exposed yourself as someone who prepares. No, well, normally I prepare. Yes, of course. Yeah, you prepare. Yes, sir. Yeah. You're a preparer. I try. Sir Stephen of Os- Oswego, two seven hundred and fifty-six dollars, uh, even. I, I, completing out my baronetcy, baronet accounting below, and rounding up to make uh, it eighteen times forty-two. Oh, yes, I like that shape-shifting 18. donation. Yeah, the shape-shifting donation times forty-two. The answer to everything in the universe. Nice. That's Jewish lucky times the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. It's got to make it super extra lucky, right? All I need is karma. I didn't get the divorce karma I requested in March, but I guess the universe decided my knighthood was enough, so I got through it. Just finished buying a townhouse so the kids have a stable home base. So this karma is for my smoking hot girlfriend that I can turn into a new MILF someday. (laughs) Wow. I love your goals, my friend. Thank you, Sir Stephen of Oswego. Milf. That's one mother I'd like to. You've got karma. James Vargas coming up with $666, Jersey City, New Jersey. My first donation was exactly two years ago when I played Noah Jen on a road trip for my girlfriend, and she asked me if I'd ever donated. Good for her. Yeah. I love her with all my heart, and I promptly deduced myself. Fast forward two years, and we've now created our own true crime podcast, Direct Appeal. Hmm. My girlfriend's a criminologist and has an exclusive interviews with a woman whom the media dubbed... The suitcase killer. The suitcase killer for the murder of her husband. She claims her innocence, and we are exploring the case. Which Detective is a, Dookie. It's a classic podcasting genre yes it's very popular yes i have supported the no agenda show in several ways over the years by creating artwork three times and having the honor of being on record as the first to identify mark pugner (laughs) oh yes but i wanted to give the podfather his due in his own words and would be honored to have adam credited as producer at large for our podcast i've taken Many of Adam's studio tips to heart, and I sincerely doubt we would have this show without my patronage to the to this show, to No Agenda. So credit where credit is due. I'm so thrilled to finally be a knight and choose the name Sir Snores a lot. Outstanding. I should I'm gonna listen to that. I'm gonna listen to your show. Was it called Direct Appeal? Yeah. yeah. yeah the, the the true crime genre and it, what's interesting about the true crime genre is that at least four of them have now gone on be, to become uh, either Netflix or Amazon series. Yeah. So that you can really boost into something crazy, crazy good from yeah, that. Can't do it with our show. So no. <laughs> can you imagine We're not on Netflix anytime soon? <laughs> hey, I got a Netflix special. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's very good. Yeah. I think did you give him? Oh yeah, you did. You gave him karma. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, did I? No, I'm going to do it right now. You've got karma. Yeah, go check that out, everybody. Meanwhile, Direct appeal. Dame that- Astrid and Sir Mark gathered together. Ooh, from Japan. Oh wow! They jumped on the bandwagon here, and they're in Tokyo uh, to uh, the great architects. World 55. famous. Dot Fifty-five. Some of the best in the world. These two are. Yes, world-class architects. Wishing you lots of happiness and countless candles around the bathtub. <laughs> wink. Wink, wink. Yeah. <laughs> That's Dame Astrid picking up on that little meme. Oh, yeah. That I identified. But Adam, take those hearing aids out before you take a dive, lest you get electrocuted. <laughs> At weddings in Japan, it's a custom to give elaborate envelopes, which we'll send by snail mail later, Ooh. with money gifts for good luck out of an enumeration that cannot be split in two. Ah. So it's always a tradition never to be able to split it in two. So that's thus five fifty five fifty five. Oh, interesting uh, how the, how these traditions we have the the Jewish eight multiples of eighteen. We have Japanese can't be split in two, which makes sense. So you have a a union, a unity. It's cool. Yeah. John, would you send a lavish Japanese wedding envelope too? Of course, if you want to get married more often. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> 
From Tokyo with love to the whole enterprise, Dame Astrid, <laughs> Sir Mark, Duke and Duchess of Japan and all the disputed islands in the Japanese Sea. In the long, Jap- sea yeah, of Japan. long, long, long time supporters of uh, of the podcast, the No Agenda Show. Thank you so much. It's very kind. I'm going to give them a karma just to, just because we love them. You've got karma. And we learned something. Cannot be split in two. Thank you. Yeah, that's a new one. Yes. Uh well, we also learned back during Valentine's Day that the chocolates are bought for the men from Dame Astrid. Oh, that's Remember right. That? Yes. Yeah. It, men get a good deal in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> Duke of Duke Jean, Jean ah, of there the he Republic is. of Texas, 333. There's also the sheriff. The sheriff. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for the well wishes. Karma for my father's full recovery. Sorry, I missed seeing everyone at the wedding. Uh, Atlas Shrug plus Monsanto 73s, K5STBE. <laughs> I think I, had, I pulled those. KF5, KF5, <laughs> KF5, yeah, KF5 TBE. Well, we like to say Kilo 5 in, uh, in the jargon. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, ooh, that didn't go well. Try again. Atlas Shrug by Ayn Rand. Monsanto. Thanks, Gene. You've got. Karma. I'm glad everything's okay. I'm glad you're back in ATX. Uh, servility, servility, uh, $233. We have associate executive producer. Please refer to me as such. Uh, it has been a year since my last donation. I asked for jobs, Carmen, shortly thereafter. Lost my job. Oh, this is not a good note. Uh, I'm unemployed for 11 months now. We're trying. Maybe it was one that period of time where we're doing the wrong jobs. Karma, I'm going to I'm gonna give him a new. Remember that? Yeah, it could be. We had this thing, I'll mention this to newcomers or people that didn't hear it the first time. We, when we had the Seattle meetup, somebody came up to me and told me that they, that the jobs karma that included Trump saying jobs, jobs, job, jinxed him. And he didn't work for about a year, same as this guy. Hmm. And we were doling out that, that left and right, jobs left karma. and right. Yeah. 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 We've been, we were doling out that faulty job. Shit karma was tainted. From, it was off. It was past it was the, tainted, past the date. Yes. It was tainted karma. Yeah, and it, we did that for some time, which we came up with the Trump one, but then we, we've now since... We've reverted, yeah. We don't use it anymore under any circumstances, although somebody did request it once on purpose. Unemployed for 11 months now, we were trying to buy a business to sell our house, move to northern Minnesota and find a house in the tough housing market, little or no inventory in the North Shore, uh, and running into unexpected, undisclosed by seller Delays, complications, oh, only request that. karma. Thanks for the great show. I hit my son, a Zoomer, in the mouth five years ago, and you're keeping his sanity as he struggles in the college campus culture. Excellent. Well, what do you think we should do? I mean, does he, he says, I only want karma, but can we just give him the old school official Nancy Jobs karma? He didn't request it. I don't think we should give it to him. Okay. Thank you, Servility. You've got karma. But, I, but he should be at least aware of the fact that we had this. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that was defective the... product. So let's, let's, let's and had a recall. So let's put it this way: if he goes back and he finds out that he was using the, that he did receive the defective product, uh, we'd be more than happy to give him a full on uh, Nancy Jobs karma. Uh, just let us know. Yeah, and of course yeah. we do, we're, we're always good re- for that. It's a, it's a worldwide recall. <laughs> yes, anyone who had yes, if you had the Trump uh, jobs karma, uh, this consider this your recall uh, and let your dealer know so that we can uh, set you straight and, and and do you right. Christopher Walker comes at two hundred dollars and one cent in the morning. Thank you for your courage. The No Agenda Show is the best podcast in the universe, without a doubt. Good tidings to you, Potfather and Mrs. Potfather as well. As well, <laughs> also to the author of the future best-selling vinegar book. Good tidings, <laughs> sir. Ah, lest I forget the squeaky chair karma. Please for the chair, or we will not hear the end of it. Now down to brass tacks. The show is great. In observance of Memorial Day, I'd like to ask for this karma, please, for the family and friends of Dustin Kreider. Well, we were in Iraq. I watched poor Dustin Kreider get shot in the face and chest during a test fire tragedy during 2004. There were no bands playing when he died, Ugh. and it wasn't very glorious. Okay, well, we'll give him some karma then. Well, and thank you for uh, helping everyone remember what Memorial Day truly is about. It is about the, uh, the fallen, uh, yes. men and women, fallen, uh, and... 
you know, for most, it's a mattress sale, I think, is how we celebrate yeah, that in America. It's, it's quite disgusting. Red tag day. Coming from a long line of military and intelligence <laughs> operatives in the United States. But thank you for reminding us, uh, uh, Christopher. And uh, this, of course, uh, goes out to um, Dustin and his family. You've got karma. Very good. Sir Mark Wilson wraps things up from the, he's the Baron of Glasgow. Gents, the show has been excellent as always. Can I please have a jobs karma with a side of I've got ants? Cheers, <laughs> Sir Mark Wilson, Baron of Glasgow. Seems like we should be able to do at least a little bit of that. Thank you very much. You got your karma coming up in a few minutes after we hear from John and the ants. I got ants. I got ants. Jobs, 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 and jobs. Uh, Let's go for really jobs. Really You've got karma. Always a fan favorite. Always. So I want to thank these folks there, the producers and executive producers for show 1141. Yeah, and I, I got uh, something in my P.O. box. P.O. box 18209. 78760 in Austin, Texas. Uh, it was uh, from Sir D.H. Slammer and the whole family. It's always so cute. This is a family that listens to No Agenda as a family. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's wild. Yeah, Sir D.H. Slammer, Dame Bang the Bang. Radio days. We've got uh, uh, Sir Andrew, Master Emmett, and who am I forgetting here? Oh, here we are. The Baron and Baroness of the Central California Coast Ventura to Santa Cruz, Dame Simona of the Purple Goats, Sir Andrew Keeper of the Mountains, and Master Emmett selected this fine craft brew while we are spirit tasting in Big Bear, California. Hey, don't worry about it. The kids can hold their liquor. And he's sent us a nice uh, six-pack of Blonde 33, which made a lot of sense to us, of course. And it was nice to receive a letter in the P.O. box, uh, which was sealed by night sealing wax and the signet ring. You, too, could have one of those. Or you could just feel good about being a part of the No Agenda Value for Value network. Uh, It's very simple. Did you heard the show? Did you learn anything? Was it worth anything to you? If it was, send us that equivalent to uh, Dvorak.org slash NA or actually go over there and see what you could do because you can do a lot. Thank you to these executive producers and associate executive producers. Valuable credits that are accepted anywhere. True, true show business credits are recognized. Dvorak.org slash NA. That's right. We got it all right here. It's called Hidden People in the Mouth. You got to propagate. Our formula is this. We go out, we hit people in the mouth. Sheriff is attack. Shut up, Okie dokie. Well, we had, well, we I, had a, uh, uh, I'm sorry. No, I was going to go ahead. We have a bunch of these guys coming out of the woodwork, these never Trumpers. Oh, we still they put them on the air and give them all this time. It's annoying. Yeah, it's kind of annoying. We even had to talk about it here. It is. So what do you got oh, then? Well, this guy, Tom Coleman. Oh, a new he's guy. A, Who's this guy? No, he's an old guy. He was a Trump hater. He got kicked out of office. And so now he shows up on CNN talking about how the president should be impeached. I don't even know if we should play it. Probably not. Okay, then let's go. <laughs> how about this? A very interesting, you know, I've helped uh, several people uh, immigrate into the United States. And, yes, you have. Yes. Uh, and through official means, official ways. And I haven't married all of them, just so you know. Uh, and I'm always happy to help. Uh, but there is a very specific, uh, when you um, petition, that's, that's the official term, when you petition for someone to uh, legally immigrate into the United States, there comes responsibility with that. It, 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 actually, a quite a big responsibility, which is you stand um, as, as, you, as a, what is the term I'm looking for? You guarantee that if anything goes wrong with this person in their uh, trial period, Yes, you get deported. <laughs> you don't get deported, uh, oh. but, but no, you won't get deported. But you are responsible for any costs or anything, any burden on society. It, it's spelled out quite clearly. And this has been part of law for uh, 
in fact, the uh, I think it was nineteen nine in the nine yeah ninety six the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Immigrant Responsibility Act um, made it a took it one step further, and the welfare reform reform laws enacted by Clinton, who was then president, the law stated that immigrants should not depend on public resources to meet their needs, but this has never been enforced. Although I've always felt that, you know, I got this, I'm, I'm responsible. Something happens, I know they can come to me. Never happened, there was never a reason for it. But it turns out this thing has never been enforced. Never. And this includes social services. M- more interesting, Martha McCullum on Fox News has no idea about this. Yeah. So, so with regard to immigration, there was an announcement today that, that basically people who had sponsored uh, immigrants to come into the country are going to be responsible for repaying any of the benefits that they take advantage of. How's that going to work? Well, absolutely. It's actually already codified into law. It was passed in 1996, signed by Bill Clinton. It just hasn't been enforced. Shockingly, the swamp takes over again. But this president says no more. It's time for those sponsors who said that they would pay for dollar for dollar matches to any federal program that paid for immigrants. It's time for them to have some skin in the game here. It's a kickstart actually to the merit based system we've talked about before. We want immigrants in this country. We're not even changing the 1.1 million immigrants that come here every year. We're not changing that number, but we're changing the construct of those who come. We want people to contribute, not to be a drain on uh, the American economy or our social safety net programs that the American people deserve. Right now, immigrants are taking advantage of it, and the sponsors, by law, are supposed to pay for that, and it's time for them uh, to put in their fair share. Let me ask you this. I am so... Yes, you want to say something? I said yay. I was going to say this. There are so many laws that apparently are just not enforced. Who knew? Uh, totally. Who knew about this? I didn't know that that wasn't enforced. It seems like a a, a, a non-brainer, just a no-brainer. So, hey, you know, this person is no good. You got to pay up. You're responsible. We come knocking on your door. I'm surprised by this. Yeah, Martha McCollum didn't even know it existed. How, how are you, you going to make that work? No, I didn't know it existed. I don't think you can call her. You didn't know it existed. Yes, she's a white woman. I can do whatever I want to say about her. Skin in the game. Skin in the game, exactly. Where does this come from? The term skin in the game. The origin of the phrase is unknown. Really? Yeah, this has been commonly been attributed to Warren Buffett, Hmm. referring to his own investment in his initial fund. Hmm. However, William Sapphire refutes Buffett as the source of the phrase, Pointing to earlier instances. Hmm. They say it may come from Merchant of Venice, the Shakespeare's play in which the antagonist Shylock stipulates that the protagonist Antonio must promise a pound of his own flesh as collateral. Ah, that's your, the pound of flesh. There you go. That's the skin in the game. That would make sense. Maybe. Um, I have a... Uh, I received a clip. It's actually a video clip. I can play some audio from it from the No Agenda Technology Lab. Now, we did some testing on one of our recent products that we were discussing on the show. And this is your power line transmission. What are they called exactly? Power line uh, Ethernet? Home plug. <laughs> home, home plug. <laughs> All right. Your, your internet butt plug. Home plug. What, it's called home plug? That's what it's called? That's the... That's the standard, yeah. One of the, there's two standards. Home plug is the one that's the most popular. Uh, and, I, and I say, well, uh, these things are a problem as far as I know because they interfere with ham radio operators. And who knows what else? Uh, so one of our producers uh, took it into the lab. And let me see. I don't know if you want his. Well, his YouTube name is uh, Fidget McFidgetron. So we'll just leave it at that. And here he is. All right. So as per John's recommendation on getting a power line adapter for getting Internet into other places of your home, I decided to get one for my garage because that's where my SDR hangout is. SDR is software-defined radio, so he's listening to the ham bands. So I got a Fahrenheit choke on the receiving end and on the output end into the computer. And let me pull up fast.com right here and watch as the web browser pops up. There we go. Got a fast.com speed test going, and look at all the QRM that this thing is putting out. And then watch as I close this web browser. A couple seconds. 
kills. And then there's a little right there. So what you obviously aren't seeing, but what you can kind of hear, is the minute he starts to use a lot of data, so he's using a speed test website, it just completely fills up the entire band with noise. There, you'll hear it. I'm going to turn it up a little bit. I believe that is also caused by this power line adapter. So it looks like I'm going to have to find a different way to get internet into the garage. Adam was right. This thing, these things cause a lot of QRM. QRM, kind of baby. Because this was a really easy thing to do. Just plug in, plug in, pair it, and go. Then I'm going to have to trench out my backyard. Oh, well. 70 degrees. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Straight from the No Agenda Technology Labs. <laughs> These things are great unless you are also a ham radio operator. Then they're not so great. I wonder what else they well, uh, interfere. I wonder if his rig his is rig. plugged into the power line that he's using for doing the data transfer to. Oh, so now we have stipulations. Okay. So I have stipulations. Now I want to know if you can have just a, like an icon, one of these, one of these, uh, battery powered, uh, right. Not, not plugged in devices, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not plugged into the same system. <laughs> That you have this battery plug powered in. hand. I would device. like to have a check. I mean, I agree. It's, it's it's handy. I can see it being a problem if you're. Uh, yeah. yeah, that software defined radio is really picky and it's about noise issues, and so you got a lot of noise. Yeah. Okay, that's what was was supposed to say. But the other, but the the main problem was it's the guy across the street that was in the olden days was bitching. So I don't think that he. This is not a, a, a test that's the one I want to see. I want to see the test of the guy across the street. Okay. So in other words, I want the, the power line adapter plugged in in a different house. Mm -hmm. And does it affect him and his house? Because that was the bitch about the, the ham guys early on, is that you plug it in anywhere in the neighborhood and all the ham guys are screwed. Right. So it, it may not carry. Okay. Well, well, we're sending it back to the lab, John. And they will figure it out for us. Secondary testing. Uh, several articles showing up in the Washington Post, the New York Times. In fact, I'll, I'll give you some headlines here. Uh, America's cities are unlivable. Blame wealthy liberals, New York Times. How no, San Francisco right. broke America's heart, the Washington Post. There's a yeah. trash and rodent nightmare in downtown L.A. with plenty of blame to go around, Los Angeles yeah, Times. bubonic plague. Rats feasting on huge trash piles sparks fears of bubonic plague outbreak in L.A. Yeah. Um, what was interesting... How about cleaning up the mess? Well, Is what's, that asking too much? What's interesting about the uh, Los Angeles Times piece is that uh, apparently uh, the... Businesses downtown in Los Angeles are paying some of the, well, I don't know if they're all, well, they, by definition, they don't have a home, but I think there's other issues, are paying them to take away their garbage and then just dumping it in the piles where the homeless people are already dumping their trash. I think in San Francisco, they changed the recycling companies. It's now by different regions of the city. And it went from an average seventy dollars a month to three hundred dollars a month. Same things happening. Businesses are uh, paying some of these people to cart off their trash and throw it on some trash heap. There are people stopping with pickup trucks to empty their trash onto the trash heaps that the homeless people have made in the streets. Nice. <laughs> this that's the opportunist amongst the Bay Area dwellers. I mean, that that shows a real moral decay. Well, it shows that opportunism. Is it moral decay to save some money? No. It, it, yes, it's moral decay if you're throwing the trash on your own street. Yes, that's moral decay. Of course it is. Okay. You don't think so? That's well, just opportunism? I, that. I wouldn't do it. I don't like the idea of these big trash heaps. Well, no. Crawling with rats and mice and God knows what. That's bad Vermin. news. That is bad news. Yeah. You know, yeah, well, that's San Francisco. That's it's a fact. There's a very interesting lawsuit. Um, it's, let me see. It's Wheaton et al. versus Apple Inc. And what is interesting about this lawsuit is it claims that Apple um, sold iTunes information uh, to third parties for marketing purposes. And the information that they sold to these third parties was 
uh, entire playlists of what you are listening to. And when you think, and we haven't even discussed this as an off-the-grid OTG uh, issue, but knowing what kind of songs you listen to is up there in importance uh, with personal preferences. I mean, I'd, if you give me your your playlist, your favorite playlist, I think I can get a lot of insight to who you are and what you're about. Um, of course, when it comes to um, online types of systems like Spotify or Pandora or iTunes, um, there's some concern when it comes to things like uh, video. In fact, there was a law on the books that uh, specifically forbade any uh, video store or library or any other uh, library-type functioning service, whether online or offline, uh, to divulge what people are reading, watching, or listening to. And I think that's probably a, a, pretty, good, a, a pretty good law to have. I didn't even know it existed. It's called the Video Privacy Protection Act. It was passed in Congress in 1988, signed into law by Reagan. And I'll just give you the actual uh, text or the important part of it. Uh, it was prevented, uh, created to prevent what it refers to as wrongful disclosure of videotape rental or sale records or similar audiovisual materials to cover items such as video games and future DVD formats. And they updated this over time to include online as well. I did not know that this law existed, and uh, it really makes me, well, it initially it made me question, like, oh, crap, how, 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 can, how can this be taking place? You know, Apple, and isn't Apple supposed to be the, the guys who, who say whatever's on oh, your yeah. iPhone stays on your iPhone? Yeah, privacy. Well, they're guys. liars. They're liars. But here, here's, the, here's the kicker. This uh, act was updated. In 2012, no, 2013, with House Resolution 6671, which amended the Video Privacy Protection Act to allow video rental companies to share rental information on social networking sites after obtaining customer permission. Netflix lobbied for the change. Obama signed it into law in January 2013. You didn't hear much about it. But isn't it interesting that the minute Obama is out of office, he gets a $100 million Netflix deal? Isn't that interesting how that works? I've always wondered why he got that deal. Always wondered. Now I know. It's, it's just uh, scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And it's quite yeah, disgusting. It's this act, these after-the-fact deals quite are... Quite disgusting. Are and it's black and white right there. He, well, he, you found out what the what the reason for that bri- reverse bribe or whatever you want to call it, after the fact bribe. Yep, yeah, we'll it's, take care of you when you're out. Yeah, uh, well, so and, we don't want to do anything now. Yeah, that's why I think a lot of these book deals, these massive book deals yeah. that these ex presidents get, they get like a you know two million dollar advance or ten. And or meanwhile, eight. we're still we're still waiting to see what genius uh, uh, Barack and Michelle are going to come up with on Netflix. Have you seen anything they've produced? They're not going to produce anything. No, it was pure. Thank you very much. Great job. You really helped us move forward. Uh, you circumvented a very specific law, which made things difficult for us. Thank you, President Obama. Here's your $100 million deal. Don't, worry. Don't have to do anything. We'll just put you on retainer. Good to go. Sounds like that's what it was. You're right. Good catch. Uh, I know you've just been in your craw. Well, there's an, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it going here with one more note from producer Glenn. We were talking about your receipts being sucked in from your Gmail. Yeah. And that's how uh, Google has this. You know, if you go to myaccount.google.com slash purchases, then you'll see purchases that you didn't even make through Google. But if you have a Gmail, and I, you know, so there's certain things that... Uh, for some reason, a confirmation email went to a Gmail account I have, and that's what shows up. Well, Glenn says in 2015, he got married, and before he got married, he spent hours and hours looking for a tux and a suit. He went to Men's Warehouse and signed up for email, or he said maybe his wife signed him up, uh, but he never bought anything from them. And of course, uh, Men's Warehouse emailed them twice a day, for every day, for ever since 2015. So he uh, put it into spam in Gmail. 
And so for the last four years, he's he never seen it. It's always in spam. He would check occasionally. Uh, but, you know, it was just going to spam. Two months ago, his grandmother died. And we're sorry to hear that. She was the first family member to pass away since he was 15. So uh, this would be his first wake or funeral as an independent adult. And he Googled stuff like what to wear to a wake. Do I need a suit for a wake? A day ago. After four years of being spam, Men's Warehouse now appears in his regular email fol- folder. It's no more marked, is no longer marked as spam. What's that all about? Some, that's, that's, what, that's the kind of stuff they're doing. You know, these guys. <laughs> you know, th- this is what we, the problem we have with the news. I got like about six or seven watchdogs out there that tell me where this thing's showing up. Yeah. And primary, it's, it's a promotions, m- newsletter mostly goes in there. Mm. Primary with a few guys. And every so often I get a note. This stuff went to spam for the first time ever. These newsletters aren't that different from what, from each other. I mean, I you know, unless I screw something up and I know what it is. But generally speaking, if you haven't seen these the Dvorak uh, uh, Curry No Agenda newsletter, it is a template. Yes. Pretty much the same newsletter uh, with different information. And is it the different information that's triggering it? Is it the one too many photos that's triggering it? You really can't tell. It's almost impossible. It's the lack of an agreement between us and Google to pay whatever we need to pay to have it delivered. That's the future of it. And if people yeah, are going to use I Gmail, then, the future. Yeah, then that's what you're going to get. And that's that's what you're going to get. And it's I also, always thought that this whole internet email thing was unreliable. I always said when I was younger, younger, in the 80s, when we were using MCI mail, and then the internet mail started coming up uh, in big ways. It wasn't still up to, up to speed. But you could get internet and it, you could get an email account from someone. I forget what the name of the company was that was providing this. But I always, I wrote a, a column in the Deck Professional, mm. which was a magazine at the time. I said, you know, this mail is unreliable. And I cited all the reasons why it's unreliable because I thought it was. And I still do. And holy crap, did I get a bunch of hate mail. <laughs> It's the greatest thing ever. It's not unreliable under any circumstances. Send mail is the best protocol. Blah, 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 blah. You know, it's unreliable. Well, I'm going to disagree with you. Uh, the I, I agree that send mail is a very reliable protocol. Uh, I think email is one of the best decentralized uh, systems that exists and has a lot of fallback and protections and delivery is pretty much guaranteed. The problem is providers of email and and the disincentivization of having anyone even understand how it works, uh, having a little box that is just your family email server at home. Yeah, they exist. Thehelm.com is a good one to look at. Um, ISPs have um, worked very hard to block uh, you having that capability at home. Uh, they make sure that oh port twenty five you can't send yo oh, you can't send out email you might be a spammer, um so they've worked hard against doing that and people got complacent it's like oh I got Yahoo Mail oh I got the AOL Mail oh, I've got Gmail I got and now you see no you don't they have your mail and there's a couple of good ones um, what's the one that everyone likes to use the uh, the secure email service that also that can that can go tits up any day too. Um, what is it everybody uses? All you're doing is describing, making my point. No, I'm not. The emails, the email as a protocol and send mail is fantastic. Proton mail, that's what it was. Uh, I'm There's not making your fast point. Fast mail, which people like. A yeah, lot. I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm not making your point. There you are. No, because you specifically said send mail and it's bull crap and it's no good. That no, shit I never works. Said send mail is bull crap, but I, I just criticized the whole mechanism. Yes, the mechanism. The whole mechanism where it goes over the internet and it disappears. Uh, gets picked up by some. And the other, the worst part, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll back off on send mail. It's fine. And there's some newer protocols that are even better. But that's beside the point. The mechanism as a whole is completely flawed. There, and even if you have your own little home server, there's still these blacklists. You subscribe to a blacklist because you don't want to get up tons of spam, which you will get. Yeah, the whole thing's a mess. I think we should go back to just snail mail. I've always said the internet should be shut down. I, I still say that. 
Yeah, said the man who, uh, you can't say these things. I said it. It's um, a reset. Do a reboot. Well, I have, and by what other protocol besides send mail? What are you talking about? What a SMTP really? Send mail is an application. But I, I'm not gonna. I'm just gonna tell you what I th- think. Okay. Uh, I, I just. I just don't think there's. I think unreliable. It's, we can't get the newsletter to half the people. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, I'm not counting people. Just don't open it. That's just a no. I understand, route. but I've received every single email. You know, two copies from two different email addresses ever since you started sending them out because I run my own server. And that has been disincentivized to to. I mean, they could make an app on your phone that is an email server. If anyone put their mind to it, but no, that's not the point. It's it's too good of a marketing opportunity. That's why. Hey, that was the first thing Google came out with was Gmail. They knew early on. Once we capture that shit, <laughs> then we have it all. And everyone went, okay, already then. I, I, I'm useless. Free, go- free gigabyte. Man, I got a gig, man. Oh, and I can take, turn it into a drive. I remember all that. Huh? Okay. All right. Make a time code, please. <laughs> That's your, I don't know what guy that is at your portrait. We know that there, guy. But- we know that guy. <laughs> He's been around. Well, um, I am still a fan of the general idea of dockless mobility in our cities. Um. I'm not sure it's it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better, but they finally uh, unleashed the bird bikes in Hoboken, New Jersey, home of Frank Sinatra, and it didn't go well. They are extremely popular and eco-friendly, but e-scooters are not getting a friendly welcome in Hoboken. People say riders are breaking traffic rules and making the road dangerous. CBS2 cameras caught people riding on the sidewalk, running red lights, and going the wrong way down one-way streets. It is such a concern on day three of the program that police have put out warning signs. I've seen so many kids out here riding around without helmets. They're weaving in and out. It's hard enough trying to avoid pedestrians. It's the most preposterous policy I've ever seen. The company that operates the scooters has set up information, tends to educate riders on safety and traffic laws. Yo, brother. The keeper and I went uh, into town last night for dinner. Can I, before you talk that, that anecdote, I do want to say... Being in Austin for the wedding, and I haven't been in Austin, as I told somebody on the airplane, I have not been to Austin pre-scooter. I'm, I'm a, P- P.S. I'm a pre-scooter. Pre-scooter visitor. So, I'm, so I go there, and there's all these scooters. It is unbelievable. Yeah. Anyway, now continue. Well, what I, was, what I was going to say is uh, we, had, you know, out here in the, in the frontier, the sticks of Austin, you don't really... You know, they're here too, by the way. They, they, I've seen them in our in our neighborhood. People ride them, I guess, all the way from uh, from UT. Maybe I don't know where they're coming from, but so they're oh, around. They can't get that far, can they? They can go. They can go twenty miles. These things. They can oh, do geez. a full hour. Yeah, if it's fully charged, eighteen or twenty miles. Uh, now it's you know it'll take an hour to do that, but yeah. I now I follow this very closely. I follow uh, not just the laws, and Texas has some uh, some laws that are coming down, which will restrict the most important things, which is riding on the sidewalk and where you park them. Uh, the parking has gotten much better, uh, although I still think it looks ugly. And if I just decided to throw some shit on the sidewalk, I would have a problem with it. But okay, I, I've I've said I'm a proponent of this. I see the benefit, but it will not work with the current culture. We can't even make bicycles work in the current culture. Uh, with cars and trucks. Austin will be the first, I guarantee you, parts of downtown Austin will be shut down for automobile traffic. It will only be for battery crap. Scooters, the mono wheels, the electric bicycles. That is where they're moving with this. They're not saying it yet, but put it in the red book. It's going to be e-scooters only in massive portions of Austin and it makes only sense that it'll happen in uh, Amsterdam. I know it's, it has to happen. Cars are, you know, they're made, they, are the, they are becoming the problem. They're killing they're the, the pe- enemy. They are. They're killing the people on the scooters. <laughs> the friendly scooters. They're killing them. And uh, they take up the place of 18 scooters. You can have a whole scooter gang in, in the place of one car on the road. So I think that's where it's going to go. Well, there are some of uh, cities in this country already that have this no car zones uh, mm-hmm. downtown. Yeah, I'm just talking about Austin, the that hot metropolis. But 
I haven't seen one that's been shut down from vehicle traffic for the purposes of allowing scooters to be zipping around. Those things are dangerous. These people are going 25 miles an hour when they shoot by you. If you get hit by one of them. Oh, yeah, it can hurt you. Know, yeah. It would be dangerous. That you know, and they got no hurt. helmet. So if they flip it or something, you know, they're going to bang their head and they do. Well, the main it's thing horrible. is is the horrible. insurance. The main thing is the insurance. Who pays for what? And you and the minute you get on the scooter, you have indemnified the company. So you're good to go there. Mm. Depends you get a vaccine while you're at it. Uh, interesting you bring that up. I found the uh, the Adam Schiff. He actually he actually put a state uh, a resolution a Senate resolution. Wait, was it Schiff? He's a he's a he's, house member. He's a house, so it can't be that. No, well, it was resolution one sixty five recognizing the importance of vaccinations and immunizations in the United States. We were talking about that. Uh, yeah, Kennedy said that uh, the, the chief right, had right. done that. He brought that up, and you, uh, we were both aghast. Yeah, so the, so it it indeed is here. It exists, uh, but it's a resolution, so it, it's not it doesn't make you do anything. But it does have everything in there that uh, oh yeah, they're good. Vaccines are good. Shut up. Shouldn't ask. And someone asked me on email, hey, if there's no really no testing data to speak of, certainly for the MMR vaccine in the United States, how does the European Union do that? So I went looking for that. Oh, my goodness. What? Oh, it, it's impossible. They have so many organizations. Euro Surveillance. Let's see. Europe's Journal on Infectious Disease Surveillance Epid- Epidemiology Prevention and Control no one has testing results. All they have is, yeah, 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 everything is safe. Here's the EU regulatory framework for vaccines. They have a framework, and the framework is... a fast one on us. Well, it's more than that. Yeah, EU regulatory framework. Before a new vaccine is approved for release on the market, a rigorous regulatory procedure to assess quality, effect, efficacy, and safety must be undertaken. But really, all they do is they just see if uh, here uh, the evaluation approval of registry what it doesn't even, here, quality assessment. Once a marketing authorization is obtained, it starts with marketing with these fucks. A marketing author- authorization, not if it's safe. No, you got to get your marketing authorization first. Once that's obtained, each batch of vaccines must still be assessed for quality before release. This is done by both the manufacturer and an official European control laboratory. The activities of these laboratories are coordinated by the European Pharmacopoeia Secretariat within the European Directorate for Quality of Medicines. Hello? Can't find anything about safety. But the European Pharmacopoeia Secretariat also has the responsibility for developing legally binding monographs to ensure appropriate quality control and harmonized quality standards across manufacturers. What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. No, it's just a bunch of gobbledygook. And, and that's it. Oh, in addition, all vaccines and pharmaceuticals are monitored after release onto the market for adverse events. This surveillance allows both to refine the safety profile established during the product development and to detect rare events that may not have been apparent during the clinical development. It's always rare, isn't it? Yeah, rare. So I, I can't, if anyone can find anything, please, I, I'd appreciate that. Uh, I'm not very hopeful. And in New Hampshire, um, I think this is a, is this an AP report? The Keene area child believed to be infected with measles, this report says, this is Concord, New Hampshire, was probably experiencing a reaction from the measles vaccine. So public, you're not at risk of a measles outbreak, state, state health officials said. So now we've, oh, about 5% of individuals vaccinated with the MMR vaccine develop a fever and rash reactions. These reactions happen because the body is responding to the vaccine. But the, the, everyone said, oh, the kid has the measles, which, of course, he did. I don't know. Yeah. 
It's just interesting. Well, we still have Ebola going on. In Congo? Or the piggy bowl? No, I got the Ebola report here. They're from, I think it's CBS. They got some, one woman, one lone reporter is in the area reporting on Ebola. And uh, this is her. Two-year-old Charity fights for her life in this Ebola treatment center. She was admitted today with her critically ill mother, Kabua Safi, who lies isolated in another plastic cube, too sick to tend to her little girl. There have been major advances in the treatment of Ebola since the last deadly outbreak in 2014. Now patients are put in these plastic cubes, which provides a protective barrier between the doctor and the patient. There's also a new vaccine, which should be good news sure. for the Democratic Republic of Congo sure. in its fight against its deadliest outbreak to date. Except to date. this epidemic is in a war zone. World Health Ebola manager Dr. Michelle Yao told us their hospitals are repeatedly being targeted by the more than 30 armed militia groups roaming the forests around the hot zones. Any time that you have an incident, it takes weeks to recover. But the violence has not deterred Esperance Musinda from her work at the UNICEF Children's Unit. She herself is an Ebola survivor. Here, they don't wear protective gear as survivors are immune from further infection. The survivors look after babies suspected of contracting the virus, but who desperately need a loving touch in order to thrive. I'm not afraid of Ebola, Musinda tells us. I'm afraid of the violence. Yeah. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. They have a bunch of these Ebola survivors, and they're just roaming around freely, and they do all kinds of work that you would normally, nobody in their right mind would do. Yeah, that situation is very fuzzy at best. Oh, and it's used, at, and they're using it on the ground as fear tactics. And uh, one of our producers uh, works with someone who's a family member of the current uh, Congolese king. We'll just call him the king. Um, and apparently it, people were freaked out about the, the, the whole election. They, they had, were, you know, dousing themselves in alcohol or their hands because, you know, they, they voted uh, on the machines and they didn't like touching the machines. Everyone's, you know, cleaning their hands the whole time. People didn't show up. It's just used as control. And now the Chinese, the Chinese official state news is saying, Hey, uh, uh, don't worry about it. We have a we have a vaccine in the works for piggy bola. It's all going to be okay. Don't look over here. There's nothing wrong with our with our pork industry. Oh, and, I haven't heard this. Well, it's the Chinese. I mean, We're talking about that porcine fever. Yes. Yeah. The the African swine flu, I believe, is uh, the way they're calling it here. Vaccines tested. This is China News, the uh, CNS, China News Service. Chinese scientists have successfully developed two vaccine candidates for African swine fever virus, the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences announced Friday. Lab tests have shown the candidates are biologically safe and effective in virus immunization. Their safety and effectiveness indexes are superior to similar research achievements in other countries. So I guess we're good. It's all over. Don't worry about it. You know how the Chinese lie about this stuff. Yeah, well, they're producing enough to inoculate every pig in china it's no way i don't think you could no, do it no. no the kid the, the the pigs that have died now is is already more than we have in america it's crazy um the bbc did a great job on uh, some more propaganda about syria and i'm not quite sure do you have any idea why uh the neocons want us to stay in Syria or want to still go and get Assad? Is it, I mean, is it something that I'm missing? Is it still the same old crap that we're dealing with? The, the Assad. West Clark 7? Oh, that could be a good I don't point. Know what the, I have no idea. I've never been, I've never fully understood what the neocons are trying to accomplish, to be honest about it, except well, rubble eyes. Well, so Syria... You know, we already now have UN reports that the White Helmets staged stuff, that the chlorine attack was staged. You had the report just uh, two days ago where they still, oh, they must have killed 23 people for no reason. No, that was probably all fake and acted as well. And so these are all, you know, kind of the definition of false flags to draw uh, foreign 
war into into the region, the us and and the France and Britain. And the BBC is just not stopping. Documents leaked from intelligence organizations in Syria suggest that human rights violations in the war there were premeditated and planned by the government. More than 5,000 pages of information have been obtained by campaigners in Washington. They include this text written allegedly by senior government security officials, which we've translated and voiced. I, I have never heard the BBC do this. So there's some text that some document that apparently was found, and we're going to find out who found it in a minute, which is hilarious. They translated it, and then they have some Arab uh, uh, national read it. Have you ever heard the BBC do this? No, not really. It gives it a whole different spin instead of just, hey, here's what the document said. No, no, no. we got an actor to voice it. In Washington, they include this text written allegedly by senior government security officials, which we've translated and voiced. We received information that terrorists are being treated in Albert Hospital in Arrastan in Homs. We suggest to bomb it with <laughs> artillery. And three days later, the hospital mentioned was bombed. <laughs> I've been speaking to Mohammed Al Abdallah, executive director of the Syria Justice and Accountability Center in Washington, D.C., and one of the people gathering the evidence and writing a report based on the documents. <laughs> this is just like one of those jamoke sitting in, a, in an apartment in, uh, in London. No, no, sounds, oh yes, this is the Syrian observation guys in D.C. Mm -hmm. I asked him how he would got hold of the information in the first place. So basically, these documents were rescued and saved from abandoned security intelligence buildings uh, from inside Syria during the conflict. And also there's other sets of documents where were extracted by other organizations, partner organizations. You'll understand that many people have a vested interest in faking evidence in the Syrian conflict. You're absolutely sure that this is genuine stuff, are you? Absolutely sure this is genuine to ask rescued and preserved. By <laughs> Let me just step back. So this is the BBC, BBC World News, world-renowned news. Have some guys on who are some think tank in Washington, D.C. for Syria. And he says, now there's a lot of fakery going on. Are you sure this is the real deal? Oh, yeah, we're sure. And that's cool with the BBC. But to me, this is, this is a great report. Partner organization, partner organization. You'll understand that many people have a vested interest in faking evidence in the Syrian conflict. You're absolutely sure that this is genuine stuff, are you? Absolutely sure this is genuine. <laughs> it was rescued and preserved by our own team. We have oh. records and videos and films inside the security intelligence buildings. And we took this video inside the, the division also to counter the narrative that the ICRC continued to deny that humanitarian aid is ending in Assad's hand as well. Is what we've just heard potentially a smoking gun in terms of court evidence in the future against the Syrian government? I hope so, yes, absolutely. This is what we're trying to do. That's why we've rescued these documents and that's why we've done this really lengthy process of analysing thousands of pages. Do these documents prove, do you think, that President Assad is personally responsible for the atrocities that, do you, that you document? We have, have not seen any documents signed by Bashar al-Assad himself in the, in the analysis so far. Um, the, but, however, the nature of the orders, the seniority and ranking of officials who signed these documents, and the nature of weapons deployed to conduct and uh, deliver these attacks all suggest this is coordinated at the highest level, and Bashar al-Assad is, if not ordering, at least he's aware. That was Mohammed Al Abdallah, who's head of the Syria Justice and Accountability Center, a campaign group in Washington, D.C. You're listening to the BBC World Service. Yeah. Outstanding work, BBC. No, I have no idea. I don't know why there, this continues, but it just it does continue. There's something, either there's some untold cache of oil. That we're not it could still be the Russia thing, you know, the Russians. It could, be, it could have something to do with Russia, it could have something to do with Israel. Yeah. Ah, it's just a head shaker to me that the, that the BBC, I mean, that is clearly propaganda. Hey, yeah. You sure this is the real deal? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we took, we got it ourselves. We got video of us getting it. <laughs> uh, uh. Yeah. I don't know. 
Did another you uh, thing? Uh, let me get another clip here. What is this? This is the. Um, this is some kind of interesting. I don't know anything about this, and I heard this clip. I played this insider dope on the. Uh, oh no, this is something else. So they had this woman. I thought there should be kind of a, just an interesting educational segment. This woman uh, is an ex CIA. Uh, She's a specialist in disguise. She's the disguise specialist at the agency. Mm-hmm. And her name is Jonah, Jonah, Jonah Mendes. Did you mention this to me maybe after a show or something? I about think this I sent you the clip. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And this is her talking about how people use aliases. And I thought I just for some reason found this to be fascinating because I didn't know any of this. Alias uh, names CIA are closely controlled. They are managed. They are assigned to you. My name is number two. You end up with a name for your entire working career. Come again. Your true name is never on paper overseas. Ruby, baby. Oprah would probably not be one of those names. This is my wife, <laughs> Oprah. Any name that really drew attention would not be one of those names. Cunningham, was it? But she Cunningham could be, but we always had a middle initial. Danger's my middle name. You always had three names. I mean, you could abbreviate the middle initial, but you always had three names. Huh. The three names is interesting. Exactly. Huh. Because whenever, whenever we got someone killing a whole bunch of people, usually three names. Yep. Which means they had a CIA name to start with, possibly. That's possible. I love that. Fantastic. So I'm going to show my uh, name. Sorry. So as soon as she said, yeah, before you go on, before as soon as she said, everyone has assigned three names and you tend to use three. And I thought about your old theories about these phony, the ones we had in the six week cycle was always some. Phony always, three always name three names. Guy. Always a three namer. Yeah. Adam Clark Curry. I'm going to show my support by donating to No Agenda. Imagine all the people who could do that. Oh, yeah, that'd be fab. Yeah, on No Agenda in the morning. And in fact, we do have a few people to thank. Not many of them with three names. Starting with <laughs> that we Mark know of. Hall. Oh, Sir Mark Hall. Let me just read this for a second. Dear Adam and John, great shows of late. Happy belated birthday. John, and a hundo to Adam for boxes and packing tape. Keep up the good work. Really enjoyed the recent wedding of the Keeper and the Crackpot. So good to meet members of the roundtable. Enjoyed talking to Mimi and was even granted a brief audience with John C. Dvorak. Truly the wedding of the year. And you were there, my friend. $167.69. Mm, merci. Sir Rod, $150. Also, an appreciation for the wedding. This is uh, uh, this is uh, Roderick. Roderick, Roderick Velo. Yeah, he he finally became a knight. He got his ring and everything, so he's Sir Rod now. Very nice. Sir Sander and Zondam. Mm-hmm. Uh, one hundred three dollars and eighty two cents. Mark Van Dyke and running. Wait a minute, that's Voice Zero. Yeah, Aww. no, I saw this too. Aww. ITM gents, and thank you for your courage. Congratulations with your marriage, Adam and Tina, and heck, why not to you as well, John and Mimi. Lol. Much love from your guy and family behind the scenes, Mark, Void Zero, Iris, and Steven. Karma for the newlyweds and original Bingo Boom Shakalaka and a Bingo Boom Shakalaka little girl, please. And may fortune be on all paths of no agenda hosts and listeners. Lots of love. Thank you, Mark. You didn't have to do that. It's very, very sweet of you. And and Stephen and uh, and Iris, thank you. I now uh, I will of course get you some bingo boom shakalaka. Brian Kaufman of Scottsdale, Arizona, seventy five seventy five. Baron Mark Tanner in Whittier, California, his twice monthly six seven eight nine. Stephen DeGina in Bethpage, New York, fifty seven forty six. I have a note here, by the way. He needs a de douching for starters. You've been de douched. Uh, yeah, he says a Can- Scandinavian expat living in New York, been listening since Brexit. Thank you for your humor, insight, and shenanigans. If you have the time, he wants a dedouching. You got that, and some karma will put it at the end for you. Um, now I have Hailko he- Santima. Santima. Five six. Hailko Hailko Santima. Sant- Santima. Uh, we have a big yellow thing. He's got some birthday yeah, thing no, there, coming up. There's a couple of things that went wrong here. Um, so we we got his donation on the previous show. Somehow we wished him happy birthday, which was a little too early. Uh, but he actually became a knight, so uh, he will be Sir Ruard of Markness. 
and he wants Beaujolais and Reblochon. Beaujolais yeah. et, et Reblochon. What is this? Is this a wine I'm not familiar with? Reblochon, is that a cheese? I have no idea. Beaujolais, I know. Um, yeah. He will be 46 on the 29th. In the morning, John and Adam, with all the new attendants at the round table on the last show, I got thinking about my own journey to knighthood. Had a feeling I was getting close to joining that illustrious crowd, but never bothered to check until now. Turns out, to my surprise, I have claimed I could have claimed a title months ago. So henceforth, I would like to be known as Sir Ruard of Marquess and would like to find Beaujolais et Roblochon at the round table. Thank you very much for your courage, and I am going to order that right now for the ceremony. Thank you for your courage, Halco. He also has an F cancer. He needs for a colleague. Oh, you know, I'm going to give that to him right now. You've got karma. You know, what's interesting is he uh, he sent the donation note to your email, and it got bounced back because it contained porn. But it didn't. It's just he he asked for an F cancer. <laughs> so, yeah, it just was my point earlier. Yeah. Well, that's your setup. I don't think. So. Yes, I, it is. it's your your male guy. Your yeah, yeah, it is your squirrel male guy. It I saw the headers. It, it came from your server. Yeah. Well, again, my point is mm-hmm. well made. Mm-hmm. David C. Pugh, uh, fifty five ten double nickels on the dime. I had congratulations on your wedding, Michael Robinson in North Melbourne, Victoria, fifty four thirty three. We have a couple of douchebag callouts in here. Uh, I don't see it. Uh, yes, we have it here. Um, oh, here it is. Yeah. Uh, he's got a couple. He's not a night. Uh, Mark Beecham of Melbourne, for one. Uh, it's a long winded note. You know, people got to tighten these douchebag call outs. Well, he's, so beca- he's become a. He's, he says, I qualified for a night. Uh, for show, on show 1124, please knight me as Sir Max <laughs> Rokatatansky, Rakata, Knight of the Soviet Socialist Republic of Victoria. I would like to request Corona Extra and peanut butter M&Ms for the occasion. And the douchebag call out the bloke uh, who hit him in the mouth hasn't donated. That is Mark Beecham of Melbourne. Douchebag! Uh, and that's the only one. So let me just make sure he is on the list for knighting today, which I think he is. Uh, yes. And yeah, what does he want again at the round table? These do interesting requests for round table. Corona Extra and Peanut Butter M&M's. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much for your courage and thank you for your support. 5432 also comes from Matthew Cole Pericone. Uh, favorite news deconstruction, uh, Sir Daddy cast of Sir Daddy cast of the Love House of Love House. That's right. Two fifty in honor of his late grandmother's birthday on uh, five twenty five. Thank you, P.D. Love Cox in Glenshaw, Pennsylvania, fifty one ninety one. Now these are the leftovers from the uh, earlier uh, fifty one ninety one donations, which are all wishing you a happy marriage. Thank you. Joel Cox in Glenshaw, Glenshaw, Pennsylvania. Todd Strobel in Vancouver, Vancouver, Washington. So it's not pronounced that way. Uh, Nick Barnes, 5191. James Murray, Huntington Beach, California. Michael Hager in St. Louis, Missouri. Hocus Locus. Uh, Grand Duke Dwayne Melanson in Tigard, Oregon. Uh, Tony Tanzi. Dan Doring and Dan Doring in Eolia, Eolia, Missouri. Jeffrey Fields in New Brownsfells, Texas. Uh, Ma- Brian Matthews, Sir Midnight of the Rivers, Gulf Breeze, Florida. Uh, Dame Patricia Worthington steps in. Uh, John Stewart son in Leicester, uh, UK. Robert Kerback. Don Bean. William Alston in Baltimore, Chris Boulton, and that's the end of that little group. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, Adam, uh, from thanks, me and the keeper. And uh, a reminder, we have a special full-length Sir Chris Wilson uh, crackpot and the keeper uh, end of show song, which is it's an original tune and well worth listening to. 
So Chris Sundberg, Night of the Vortex Ring State from Mercer Island, $51. Scott Nelson in Melbourne, Florida, $50.01. Now, the following people are $50 donors, name and location, if available. My, Mitchell Kaufman in Hillsboro, uh, Oregon. Joe Winky in Santa Rosa. Ah, is that's G. Joe from uh, Jambo. Jambo Joe. Jambo Joe. Mm -hmm. Jambo. Jambo. Go look up the Jambo products. They're fantastic, everybody. You got some uh, new ideas. Uh, Anonymous G in Raleigh, North Carolina. Julian Robbins in Aptos, California. Jesus Allen in Austin, Texas. Hmm. And last but not least, Baron Allen being over here in Oak Town, Oakland, California. I want to thank all these folks for producing show 1141. And... Um, Hope we have another good uh, donation segment on the next Thursday show. Yes, and thank you to everyone who came in under fifty dollars. Uh, most of you will do that for if you're right under that for anonymity, but a lot of you are on uh, programs. Some of you do both, and the uh, the subscription programs are very helpful to us. They do keep a base going. Uh, there's uh, very low ones, you know, four dollars a month, five dollars a month. You can do eleven, eleven, thirty threes. There's a number of good ones. Please check out all the opportunities at Dvorak.org slash n a. And thank you for your courage. Uh, Karma's as requested. Jobs, 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 and jobs. Let's vote for jobs. Yay! 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 You've got karma. Well, it's kind of short, actually. We only have two birthdays to look at. Hayako Santama, who turns 46 on the 29th. And tomorrow, May 27th, which is actually already today, 54 years old and trips around the sun, our very own Sir Chris Wilson. We say happy birthday to both of you from everybody here at the best podcast in the universe. One on the list, Sir Stephen of Oswego has upped his game and he changes his peers to the title of Baronet for another $1,000 in support of the No Agenda podcast. Thank you for your courage, Sir Stephen of Oswego. Now, brand new, freshly minted Baronet. One, two, three, four. We've got four knightings to do. One of them could be a dame, we don't know. No, we do know because he wants to be Sir Rib Ear, so we need uh, blades at the ready. Coming, coming. Okay, I'll take that. Anonymous, James Varga, Halko Al Santama, and Michael Robinson. Please, all of you, step up to the podium. You are about to become Knights of the No Agenda Roundtable thanks to your support of the program and the amount of $1,000 or more. And you get a title, you get a seat, and you get some cool stuff to consume. So I hereby pronounce the KV, Sir Ribier. Sir Snores a Lot, Sir Ruard of Marquinez, and Sir Max Rockentatansky, Knight of the Soviet Socialist Republic of Victoria, gentlemen for you, Hookers and Blow, Rent Boys and Chardonnay, Beaujolais and Rablochon, Corona Extra with Peter Butter and M&Ms, Warm Beer and Cold Women, Gerbils and Ginger Ale. And mutton and meat. I ran out of stuff to put at the table. Go to noagendanation.com slash rings and uh, hand off your information to uh, Eric the Shill. He'll get you to you as soon as possible. Quick mention of our meetups that are coming up. May 25th, uh, Eastern North Carolina. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, also on the 25th. Tel Aviv, Israel. May 29th, the 30th of May, Charleston, South Carolina. June 2nd, Sarasota, Florida. The 6th in Seattle. The 7th of June, Toronto. 8th of June, Oklahoma City. June 9th, Knoxville. Somewhere there should be June 12th. I'd love to do a meetup in London. Uh, the Keeper and I will be there. If someone can get that at noagendameetups.com, we'd love to meet some of our UK folk. June 12th, Wednesday, June 12th would be the day for us. After that, it's June 15th in Copenhagen. We won't be able to make that. June 20th is Southwest London. Unfortunately, we won't be able to, to attend that. So maybe we can get the same people to do a quickie on the, on the 12th. July 4th, Seattle, and July 13th, in Atlanta. And whoever sent us the Cuisinart ice cream maker, thank you. I wish I knew who it was so I could thank you properly. It's got an anonymous Cuisinart ice just, cream maker? Yeah, just showed up at the, the... one or two quart. It's the big one. Yeah. It's nice. It, it, yeah, you know, it's just I have one. It was an Amazon, Amazon shipment, but um, there was no note, no... Yeah, Amazon fails to put notes in. They're supposed to put notes. Was it in a big, giant gift bag? 
No, it wasn't in a gift bag. It was just in a box. And no. that was it. Yeah. You ever seen you said send as a gift? You check that box and you it's just a bag. Oh yeah. Or you say I want I want to add a note and they just print off a piece of paper with a note. Oh, yeah. Thanks. That's not even a nice card or anything. No, no, and it's a bag. The bag is just some cheap bag they throw everything yeah. in. Yeah, there's still yeah. Uh, there's still talk of me uh, being one of the hosts of the European Song Festival for 2020. I think it'd be ideal. If not, I do have a backup. Uh, the the millennials here had a great idea. We should do a Twitch yeah. a Twitch stream. Makes so much sense. I didn't even think about it. And we could actually make money while doing it. You know that How works. We're gonna make money. Well, Twitch has a whole financial thing. Like people can. No, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they, they hit a button and then money just pops into your account. Oh, nice. Yeah, so we so we can literally just be showing uh, a a monitor of whatever's happening, and we can be off camera doing our snarky voiceover. And if people like it, pling pling pling, they'll just be sending us money. I think this is fan- this is a good idea. So every one liner. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, we can do this, John. We can do is we have yeah, a whole okay, year well, to prepare. I'm expecting that we will do it. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm not going to be hosting this show. You know, this is like, no one's going to let that happen. You'll be hosting this show, then we won't do it. I'll do it by myself. And what there's is- Adam. Look at him. Holy crap! <laughs> what is? Who made him up? Do they have makeup artists there on the show that they actually know what they're doing? <laughs> he looks like an old transvestite. Oh, okay, thank you. I yeah, wanted to, I wanted to say something about. Let's the- hope he doesn't dance. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> that would be it took bad. Took a while on that one. Jeez. Oh boy. Uh, this milkshake mania. I wanted to talk about that for a second. Oh, jeez. I never even thought about talking about it. But you're right. It's probably worth talking. We probably should talk about it. Yeah, it's very important. So Nigel Farage uh, was walking around. Someone threw a, a milkshake over him. This is now a thing, you know. And uh, it, oh, it was interesting. Even on the someone someone sent me a link from some a-hole somewhere on Reddit saying, oh, John and Adam should be worried. They're going to be throwing milkshakes. And I want to oh, yeah. say something. So now, so- don't you remember the pie era? Well, n- no. Yeah, there was a, a little era about seven, eight years ago where people got a pie in the face well, by I- some pie guy, this well, no, major I'm, pie character. I'm, I'm going- Bill Gates got a pie in his face. Well, milkshakes are different for a very specific reason. But first, I want to go back to uh, the year... 2000, uh, Pim Fortin, two weeks before he was assassinated, people were throwing cakes in his face. Yeah. And when, and I, I did some research on this. There is a, uh, when people start throwing food, it is an actual act of desperation because food has value and, uh, and more importantly, there is a connection between us and uh, primates, apes, chimpanzees, who throw shit. And I believe that the milkshake, particularly the chocolate milkshake, is a very primal thing that is deep in us. It, as it's a, a metaphor for throwing feces at somebody, but it is did, what did Farage have a chocolate? Shake? Yes, chocolate shake. I believe it is. An extremely violent act, and uh, it should not be tolerated. It's not funny, and it it pretty much always leads to something bad. The people who do this have a screw loose. It's it's different from hitting someone, which is a whole different area. But when you do the milkshake, it is a primal scream of uh, frustration and it, and anyone who does that is on is in my mind borderline dangerous yeah i agree it's a it was a strawberry shake well that's <laughs> what does that mean well i can, i don't know it's not dark enough to look like feces but i think the uh, the comparison still holds um it is. It cannot. It's not funny. It should not be uh, allowed. People who do this need to be dealt with. It is very, very violent, and it's and people who do this are on the verge of a uh, a psychological breakdown. Yeah, well, this guy was a fanatical Remainer and a Corbin fan. Yeah. Well, the uh, the people who did that to Pim Fortin before he was assassinated were, uh, you know. 
animal rights activists, greenies, and one of them, a not the same one, but one of the same persuasion, wound up assassinating him, shooting him in the head, in his yeah. right, right to his face. Boom, boom, goodbye. And by the way, he's now out free, walking around. He served his time. It's a crazy country, the Netherlands. How oh, that works? Guys yeah, should be locked up for good. No, nope, we don't have that in the in the Netherlands. There's no locked up oh. for good. In fact, there's often a joke. It's easier to kill your wife than to divorce her. It's much much cheaper. You, you, it's much less hassle. In a couple of years in jail, you're good to go. Hmm. Sounds like yeah. So I have nothing more to add other than this is not funny. It should be uh, dealt with as an extremely vi- as a violent act. It's a violent act. And don't try that in Texas. Oh, can you imagine? <laughs> it's a bad idea in Texas. Uh, so, so I found they found a very funny clip. Democracy Now did, uh, which is going to be. I'd be surprised. As, you know, the, you always have to wonder how serious everybody is about things when you have a clip like this floating around. It doesn't get any play. Mm-hmm. This is uh, Lindsey Graham. Uh, discussing impeachment. This is the basic theories of impeachment. I believe this is during the Clinton administration when he was still a congressman. In 19... And he Sorry. Part, yeah, and he could take part in impeachment proceedings. In 1999, the then Congressman Graham argued for the impeachment of President Bill Clinton for seeking to hide evidence of his affair with White House intern Monica Lewinsky. This is what he said. You don't even have to be convicted of a crime lose your job in this constitutional republic if this body determines that your conduct as a public official is clearly out of bounds in your role because impeachment is not about punishment impeachment is about cleansing the office impeachment is about restoring honor and integrity to the office all right I thought that was pretty good. Well, isn't that I what mean, it's... I think it's bull crap and nobody's <laughs> ever to go along with the program because of the fact that no, why everybody would they? in Congress is corrupt. <laughs> yes. So they're not, you know, they feel guilty about, you know, well, he's corrupt. Is he more corrupt than I am? I don't mm. know. <laughs> is he more corrupt than Adam Schiff? That guy. Did you hear what happened so... to Naomi Wolf? Did you hear this? No. Oh, this was fantastic. So she's written a book. Um, I don't have the whole backstory. I, let me see. I have the book here somewhere. The book is it's about outrage and killing killing people for just for who they love. Here it is. Uh, I always get Naomi Wolf com- uh, mixed up with Naomi Klein. You no, know, this is a show problem in general. We the do Klein this all the time, and, and they're both left wing nuts. And but one of them has actually got some reasonable you know logic to her where she goes about her business i think i think wolf's the one i particularly don't like well she's the author of uh the book vagina and the forthcoming book outrages sex censorship and the criminalization of love and yeah, and she expected to, to she expected to discuss the historical revelations uh about people being uh killed for being gay basically and she went on the BBC to promote this. And now this book is coming out in a week from now. And the host did something phenomenal. He looked up some of the stuff that was in the book. And it turns out she had misinterpreted an important term when it comes to killing people for who they love. In this, in this case, it's about uh, buggery, uh, gay acts. And the BBC host just basically ruined her entire book before it even hit Amazon. You get (laughs) sentences, as I mentioned, of penal servitude for 10 or 15 years. And I found like several dozen executions. uh, But that was, again, only looking at the um, Old Bailey records and the crime tables. uh, Several dozen executions. Correct. And this corrects a misapprehension. that is in every website that the last man was executed for sodomy in Britain in, in 1835. I don't, I don't think you're right about this. One of the cases that you look at that, that, that's salient in your report is that of Thomas Silver. It says um, 
teenagers were now convicted more often. Indeed, that year, uh, which is 18... 59. 14-year-old um, Thomas Silver was actually executed for committing sodomy. The boy was indicted for an unnatural offence. Guilty. Death recorded. This is the first time the phrase unnatural offence entered the Old Bailey records. Thomas Silver wasn't executed. Death recorded. Yeah, I, I was really surprised by this, and I, I, I looked it up. Death recorded is the, is what's in I think most of these cases that you've uh, um, you've identified as executions. It doesn't mean that he was executed. It was a category that was created in 1823 that allowed judges to abstain from pronouncing a sentence of death on any capital convict whom they considered to be a fit subject for pardon. I don't think any of the executions you've identified here actually happened. <laughs> well, that's a really important thing to investigate. <laughs> what is your what is your understanding oh, of what, what death recorded means? Death recorded, this is also from, that, I've just read you the definition of it there from the Old Bailey website. But I've got here a newspaper report about Thomas Silver and also something uh, from, uh, from the prison records that, that show the date of his discharge. The prisoner was found guilty and sentence of death was recorded. Yeah. Ah, but see, but the, the jury next... recommended the prisoner to mercy on account of his youth. See, I think this. I think this is a kind of. When I found this, I didn't really know what to do with it because I think it is. I think it's quite a big problem with your argument. Also, it's the nature of the offence here. Thomas Silver committed an indecent assault on a six-year-old boy. <laughs> so, uh, oops! Oh God, that's horrible. What happens? The publisher is going. Well, we have fact checkers, but ultimately, we rely on the author. What happens in a case like this? I mean, can they pull the book back still, or is oh, it yeah. printed? Yeah, they, they actually should pull the book back. Of, co of course they have to. The whole premise of the book is about being condemned and uh, and killed for loving who you love. This is That's like your vinegar book, you know, like all of a sudden, you know, well, you, the vinegar kills you. I don't know, something would happen. I think you're smart, actually, for... For delaying the release, make sure you have all your <laughs> your T's crossed and your I's dotted. You're very finding out more and more weird stuff about vinegar. We're doing some more. Mimi's gotten into this like vinegar thing now, so she's wow. digging up crazy stuff. She's taking the shaming to heart. No. <laughs> all right, we have um, a number of end of show clips. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, Sir Chris, the drunken, the drunkard minstrel. The song is titled The Keeper. It's an original. Uh, soon available on compact discs and cassettes. We have an end of show from Tom Starkweather, always fun. And Jesse Coy Nelson, who's just been knocking it out of the park recently. So that is coming your way in a moment. If you're listening to us on noagendastream.com, we've got the Mark and George show, episode number 29 on deck for that. And I am coming to you from the frontier of Austin, Texas. It's the capital of the Drone Star State. We're in FEMA region number six on the governmental maps in the morning, everybody. I'm Adam Curry. And I'm from northern Silicon Valley, where we're still waiting for 1999 KW4 to go swinging by. I'm John C. Dvorak. We return on Thursday right here on No Agenda. Please remember to support us at Dvorak.org slash NA. Until Thursday, adios mofos and such. Three, three. Is this a good woman or what? No, I just, I can't remember anything. She's a keeper. Not only does she pack light, but she donates to the show. Yeah, with packing light, I would put a high priority on it. <laughs> ah, I love this woman. She's great. Wow! Spend my younger years surrounded by rock stars. Actresses and models, well, you see, I bear the scars. Resign myself to an OTG love life. John C. Dvorak as my wife. Pickens pretty slim when you get into our age. And options they're narrow on a podcaster's way. Tina used to love me the way I am Even though I'm a radio hand Our love is wider than all of it, Mo Nation Our love is deeper than Moss in aviation Each episode
episode, our love grows deeper. One reason why you're the keeper. Never thought I'd find my Texas bell. But you came here from Chicago, so I'll thank Obama as well. You know my love, I'll always be there. With a retarded phone, an old VJ here. Our love is stronger than 5G radiation. Our love is hotter than a burning radio station. Send flirtatious texts. The beeper, another reason why you're the keeper. Well, I'm perfect, but this sure beats being single. And it's material for Sir Chris to write his jingle. Gold name and beer, but it done it all for free. Inspired by the love between you and me. As we drive off. On our airstream honeymoon But Sunday on a Thursday Happens all too soon Can't monetize the love Between you and me But it'll make the perfect exit strategy Our love is wider Than all of good motivation Our love is deeper Than the loss in aviation Our love is stronger than 5G radiation Our love is hotter than a burning radio station Two reds goes way when I see you Another reason you're the keeper Then I saw your face, now I'm a believer Another reason you're the keeper Skinny and I don't cost much to feed you. Another reason you're the keeper. Health insurance costs, they're getting steeper. Another reason you're the keeper. Turn off my hearing aid so I can't hear. Another reason you're the keeper. The chat room, Tina the Keeper. Tina the Keeper. <laughs> and, and she'd be keeping you. So I walked into the cabinet room. You had the uh, the group, crying Chuck. To watch what happened in the White House would make your jaw drop. Crazy Nancy. I tell you what, I've been watching her, and I have I have been watching her for a long period of time. She's not the same person. Job Bob Boss. Job Bob Boss. She's not the same person. She's lost it. Let's go for jobs. You all saw me minutes later. I was at a news conference. I was extremely calm. Calmer than you are. I was probably even more so in that room. So I was extremely calm. Calmer than you are. Let's go for jobs. In the morning, generals gathered in their masses. This is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years. Just like witches at black masses. When I first came to office, one of the first meetings I had was at the Pentagon with generals. Evil minds that plot destruction. Bolton has always said, let's go to war, but he's not the one who's going to go in the forefront. He's a coward. Sorcerer. Death construction. The leaders of Iran are racketeers. Behind every problem is Iran. They heard what you said in 2016 and liked it when you said no more stupid wars. You got a rogue president in the White House surrounded by these Uber hawks that thirst for another war with Iran. We don't need your war! National Atomic Energy Agency has never found Iran in contravention of stipulations in the deal. We don't need your war! 
If Iran wants to fight, that will be the official end of Iran. Never threaten the United States again. I'm not somebody that wants to go into war. Is the United States heading towards another Middle East showdown, this time with Iran? Dvorak.org slash N-A Sharp as a tack.